Okay, and we are live. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to some of you, wherever you are viewing from in uh, wherever part of the world you are. It is a pleasure to be back with you. I apologize for last night. I would have left a, I would have left a, a, a note, a message stating that we had an island-wide uh, power outage. And this was so funny because at 8.45, I was in position ready to log in when everything just went black. And I do have a backup battery for my computer, but that's something that'll last like 30, 40 minutes. So, <clears throat> and you know your brother long-winded, right? <laughs> Nevertheless, we're back and it's great to see all of you guys in here. I am happy to be back for us to continue with our final teaching. I was very disappointed last night, to be honest with you, because... I really, 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 really wanted to to do that. I was on a on a high uh, the entire day because I was so uh, filled and power packed uh, to make this delivery. But of course, whenever this happens, I've seen many of you made the comments too. Whenever I have a, a really, really uh, impacting message, I this is the norm right here. Either the, the power would go off, uh, something crazy beyond my control would happen. But that's good, though. That's good because it's a clear indication that we are all on the right track, all right? So we are 272. I'm just going to wait till we get to like about 600 in a few seconds here. In the meantime, I'll just check to make sure all of my social media sites are up and running. Okay, great. While I'm at this, uh, I want to make this quick announcement. <sighs> a lot of you guys write me a lot of letters, and I love it. I love it. All right? And I normally give you, I have two mailing addresses. I have my Bahamas mailing address. Then I have the U.S. mailing address, which is stationed in Texas. It's a company that I use called usa to me And what they do is uh, they allow all my mail to come there. And then every end of the month, they consolidate it and send it here to the Bahamas FedEx, which I get the next day. I'm telling you all of that because whenever you write me, please, even if you email me, always include a phone number. Always, please. Either phone number or email address because at random, depending on what it is that I'm reading, I prefer to just pick up the phone and give you a call right there and then. And that's much convenient for me. I don't have a problem with taking care of the calls. Put a phone number there, whether you're going to use your WhatsApp or whether you're going to use your cell, your landline. Put some communication in terms of, uh, prefer preferably, I would prefer a telephone number. Uh, if not, then you can put an email address. Because a lot of you write me a lot of e sorry mails through the post and you state your whole case and you don't put a phone number or a email address. Now, I'm not one to write mails and send them in the post office. That's, that's I don't do that. <laughs> I don't have the time to do that. But I could do a quick email after reading that letter. Or even better, give you a call. I've surprised many of you, many, some probably watching right now, who have done that. I didn't ask them to do it, but they put their phone number in there. And when I call them, they first of all, they weren't convinced that they were speaking to me. So I had to uh, bust a few of my jokes on them that I know that they were familiar with. <laughs> so they were convinced. <laughs> so if you're going to write me a letter, please put a number, a telephone number, a phone contact, or an email address. But preferably, I prefer a phone number. doesn't matter where you live in the world. Just put a phone number there that I can reach you. And I would definitely, not all, I wouldn't guarantee I would call all, but as the Lord lead me, I would definitely... Uh, give you a call. Okay, we're up and running. Boy, I'm so excited tonight. And I'm sure you guys are excited also. Okay, beautiful. Okay, Sonia Trot, I see you. <laughs> I see Sonia. All right, well, how far are we? 445. Oh my God. Let me tell you something. This is an interesting topic deliverance. And based on the two teachings we've had so far, part one and part two, there's a lot that we've learned. You know, the first night, Tuesday night, we dealt with uh, dealing specifically with God's set times, and that's the basis uh, basis in terms of the format of deliverance. And what I was trying to get you guys to understand that 
if you roll up on somebody or somebody roll up on you and they trying to convince you that they could deliver you at any time because they put their hand on you or you sold money into their life or they give you some oil or item or what have you and that because of that they could just deliver you then basically they're saying that they are God because a prophet, a healer, or whoever you are that God will use to bring about deliverance to his people. I can assure you whenever that person was delivered, it was at the set time that God had ordained before the foundation of the world. Deliverance as it relates to set times is what gives God the, the order that he has. That's what sets the order. And remember, because, remember, let's, let's look at some of the characteristics of God now. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. He knows the end from the beginning. So before the foundation of the world, he knew the troubles I would have had. He knew the ups and downs, the, the obstacles, the opposition, the enemies. In fact, I would go as far as telling you that it was through his wisdom that he orchestrated the right enemies for our lives. Okay, the way that he set up our lives, these would be the enemies, and I speak from experience, that will cause you to do something that you would have never done under circumstances. And for the most part, and like in my case, it, it pushed me further into prayer and fasting because I was like, there has to be more to this Christian walk than just saying I'm a Christian and, you know, following all of the surface rules and never ever getting into the depth of it. So God did all of this. So now when he released you into the earth through your parents, your life was already programmed spiritually. However, I always make this, this uh, disclaimer. You don't, 90% of us don't follow the pattern or follow what God has set out for. That's even more than 90, more than 90% initially. Now as life go on and we go through all of these ups and downs and we come into the right relationship with God and really understand what the rules and the regulations are, then we are now better able to follow the pattern that he had in place way before the foundation of the world. So now it makes sense. You might see somebody next to you or a friend who was delivered from alcohol, drugs, or delivered from pornography or cheating, whatever. But then you had the spirit of rejection for years and you weren't delivered from that. Well, one of the reasons could be that your set time to be delivered uh, has not arrived as yet. Now, in between the time of, of you being whatever you're under, let's say rejection, and deliverance, you see, that time is precious. And again, I speak from experience. Because during the time I was crying out to God and pleading and begging and just asking him to take the pain and the depression and stuff away, I was studying the word of God. I was reading the word of God. I was deep into the word of God. I was, as you see some of these books in the back here, I have, I have tons of, I have boxes of books. And this was from a man who hated reading initially. I never read, I hated it prior to becoming a Christian. This is one of the things that God did for me, gave me this desire and passion to read and to educate myself. Now, what I didn't realize then was that that was giving me this major edge, this major uh, head start, and this can sound crazy, head start in the sense that when I do get into the full-time church arena, which I would now begin my training under different pastors, that studying came in handy because unlike most of them, things didn't, didn't fly over my head because for some reason, as I got the word of God in me, the word of God in and of itself now begins to, it's like, a, it's like a, what do they call those people at the airport that checks your luggage and stuff before you go to your gate? I can't remember they call them, but whatever they call them, that's how the word of God is in you. It is those people that put your bags through the x-ray and run that one over you, or you stand up in the machine with your hand over here for the thing to spin around to see if you have any metal or stuff. But whatever their name, no, not the porters, no, not they, they carry the bikes. These are the ones, once you've already left the reservation, Scott, and you go through security, there's a specific name, um, TSA, there you go, TSA, the TSA folks, right. And that's how the word of God was for me. It was like the, a TSA uh, agent. So when I was sitting in these churches and I would hear people preach, or even if I'm watching a program, a Christian teaching, whatever, it's like when I'm hearing stuff that didn't line up with the Word of God, 
But the TSA agent, which should have been the Holy Spirit, will just arrest that. Now, this don't make sense because the Bible is saying this here. So that's how it became. So for me, I was in your regular uh, sheep going to the slaughter, for lack of a better phrase. I was always, you know, acutely aware of what I was listening to. And I took a lot of notes. I have books of just notes. And this was all in my earlier part of coming up. And when I would have left one church to go to another church, because I never subscribed to, oh, you got to be released from the past, the foolishness. Again, I was a studier of the word prior to going to church. All right, let's be clear there. Well, after I got saved, that is. So for me, I never fell under the, <clears throat> the witchcraft stuff of covering. I never believed in that. Never, ever. Never believed in that. I never believed in a past stuff to release me. All of this is going against the word of God. And I never believed in it. So for me, I was always a free thinker as it relates to the knowledge of God that I got from the Bible. So no one could have come to me and tried to force their will or opinion on me as it relates to Scripture and get me to conform to their little uh, prison they got going over here called a church. So as time went on, the more I read, the more <sighs> through my reading and studying and commitment to the Word of God, and I'm going to tell you this, it's going to birth revelation in you. Revelation simply means that these were nuggets in the Word of God that were always there. But now you reach to this point of maturity in your spiritual walk where God begins to release those revelations to you, which is what I do all the time. And sometimes, you, you guys may not believe this, when I'm teaching, I'm actually getting revelation at the same time. So not only you are benefiting from these teachings, I myself, the teacher, benefit. And there are times when I shut off everything and write down certain things that I said. And I know the Holy Spirit is saying to me, now go study this some more. There's some more of this you need to explore. And boom, this is where the revelations uh, the revelation come come from. So the first night we dealt with the set time, the appointed times that God has already put in place, no matter what we will go through, what we've been through in the past, now, or even in the future, God has already, like the scripture said, he has made a way of escape. He has made a set time. To escape means to leave something that, that had you incarcerated or held down or subdued. So God has made provisions for us, whether it's a bad marriage, whether, and let's, let's go to the marriage thing again, because I've seen people write some stupidness in my feed that I had to delete, right? Listen, when I talk about divorce and marriage, I speak about my experience. I speak about the experience of others. There is in no way do I promote people divorcing or whatever. I, that is not my aim in saying that I'm saying to you, I'm saying to you, and you don't have to agree with this, and if you don't agree, you're a liar. <laughs> Here's what I mean by that. Not every man and woman that goes to an altar and the pastor say, whom God has put together, let no man take asunder. Now, I'm not making no excuses here for nobody to get divorced or none of that, but I'm, I'm trying to get you to think sense now because I know you on this... Uh, I know when you came to a particular church, they tell you you don't need your brain anymore. We have a pre-programmed brain here for you. What I'm saying to you, and I'm sure everybody can attest to this, you cannot tell me every two couple that decide to be husband and wife, God put them together. So therefore, if God did not put them together, you cannot expect the results to come from this union. That if God called me and you together, if God called me and you to be together before the foundation of the world, but I made the decision that I don't want Mary, I want Sally. I cannot expect what would have happened between me and Mary, that God had not only ordained for us to be together, but what will come through us, not just children, not just getting a home together, but life and impacting the lives of others. I should not expect this. If I marry somebody else. Now, why is that? Well, it is that way because what you're saying is that, God, I know you had a plan for me, but my plan is better. And you know just as well as I do that it's utter rubbish. So I'm not promoting. I had a divorce. I'm not ashamed of that. I, I didn't ask to be divorced. I didn't beg to be divorced. I was divorced. End the story. I couldn't, you can't make somebody love you. You cannot make somebody stay with you. So these religious clowns who talk in nonsense, until you walk that road, you are not qualified to have any discussions on it. I'm sorry. 
Now, if your marriage is perfect, then you go get a YouTube channel or Facebook channel, and then you label it the perfect marriage, and then you teach them how to be perfect. But there are people, there are people who are not compatible. There are people who got together for whatever reason, but this was not the will of God. And as a result of it, the friction, the turmoil, and everything that else that comes along with it, you know, this is what it panned out. But thanks be to God that because he knew what would happen, then he calculated remedies to this. So whatever he gives you as a remedy, that with you and him, okay? Uh, secondly, I want to clear up another thing. Uh, I had someone send me an email, and they were saying to me, they were trying to inform me, actually, telling me, uh, I heard you spoke about the shofar and the, and whatever that scarf name. <coughs> And they were telling me how, what it represented Israel and blah, blah, blah. Again, people, if I, if people would spend like 80% listening as opposed to 99% listening to seek for error, they would be better informed. I never despised the shofar. I never despised the scarf. What did you say, Kevin? Repeat it again for them. I said for you, the shofar, the scarf, the miracle oil, the miracle M&Ms or whatever it is that you have that your church do, this cannot replace the rules, the regulations of the scriptures. That's what I said. So don't be writing me no nonsense because I del- when I don't start, I keep telling you, when I start reading, I, I keep seeing nonsense, I delete it. I don't listen to foolishness because you're not, you're so eager to criticize. You're so eager to say, oh, I got him now. Yeah, take that. But what, you, what is your profit in doing that? And if you feel that way, why don't you get it? I don't get it. If you if you don't like what I say, why do you follow me? Why do you listen to me? You follow every program I perform, I, I do. You could go verbatim everything that I said, and you still wouldn't get saved. My God, wicked. <laughs> wicked. So my point is, all of these suggestions you're giving me, why don't you be useful to the kingdom of God? Go establish your, your Twitter, go establish your Facebook, go establish your YouTube, and go on there and then teach what you believe. Simple. I don't know what these people's problem is. They love me, though. They just have a different way of expressing it. <laughs> That's all. And I love them too, man. But they need to get safe. Except Jesus. They're too wicked. But in any event, so when I talk about, I don't want to hear but no shofar, and I don't care but no scarf, it is not in a derogatory way. And if you continue to listen, you will see my point. They cannot replace what the word of God says. For example, if the word of God says, give and it should be given unto you, you can't go put a shofar and blow it over $10 and say, God is going to supply. You can't take the scarf and put it over $20 and say, now watch God open up the windows of heaven. The Bible doesn't say that. What the Bible does say If you give to the poor, you will never lack. If you give to the poor, you're lending to God. So these are the things that we have to put emphasis on. What God say and what it will produce. We cannot insert stuff. All right? So I just want to be clear there. Again, one more thing. I guess remember one more thing. Talk about, I was talking about the false prophet. Again, these jokers still writing me talk in ignorance. Uh, Kevin, I don't think it's right for you to to watch the famous words because they're trained to do this, to bash the pastors and the prophets. Who bah, who passed I, I bash? Who prophet did I, I bash? I always put my disclaimer when I said I have to say, whoever this affect, it is you that I'm speaking to. Did I call your pastor, pastor, see it so? Did I call your pastor, pastor, shake you down at the front door? Did I call any of them? No, I didn't. But where you are so guilty as well, as your uh, leaders who are financially raping people on a 24-7 basis, now you want to come and change the matter. But I keep telling you that's not going to happen here, and you can't stop what I'm doing here. There's nothing you could do. You don't pay for nothing here. You don't pay for no lights, no nothing. I don't ask you for your money, so you can't come back and say, I give you money. No, that's why I don't ask you. That's one of the reasons. So you can't stop nothing here, period. Now, going back to the prophecies, and I was getting down on this three nights of darkness, all right? People, I say to you all the time, whatever you want to know what God says, look right in the Bible. Look right in the scriptures. All right? I think Matthew 24 gives us an itinerary as to what to look out for 
when the coming of the Lord is near, right? Okay, so when we look at the three days of darkness stuff, so what could we look in in, in any of Jesus' uh, predictions or prophecies of the end time? Can we find that he put in there that three days of darkness would be a prerequisite to the end time? You're not going to find it. Are there times that the three days of darkness happened in the Bible? Yes, it happened in Exodus, which was a part of the plagues. And I think it's mentioned somewhere else in Amos or somewhere else. But in none of these is it saying that just before Christ come three days of darkness. So I'm saying to you, why do you listen to people who are telling you these things are going to happen in the end time that the scriptures does not say? Anyway, we will go down. Let's pray for their salvation. They need to get saved. They need to know Jesus. They need to know Jesus. They need to know Jesus. Now, let me tell you who I do respect. Who do I respect highly? My good friend, Jacqueline Richardson, her husband, Will Richardson. In fact, if you check my Facebook page, I posted a prophecy that they recently did. I think it was last week, right? I believe it was last week. And this isn't the first time this lady has prophesied stuff concerning the Bahamas and the Caribbean that has come to pass. She, in the most recent prophecy that was specifically for the Bahamas, in fact, I'm going to post that on my YouTube page. I only did it to Facebook. As you would know, as of today, Facebook is going to stop one of the watch parties. But anyway, Mrs. Richardson clearly stated for for the Bahamas, I see blood all over your streets. I, I mean, she just goes in detail. Did not we had seven, sorry, six people killed yesterday in a vicious shootout. Blood all over the place. I was, people were sending me videos like crazy. I mean, it was the most vicious, horrific stuff in our little Bahama Island. See, people that I can respect. You see, now, even though she didn't even, she didn't even give a day, but she, she made it clear what was happening. See, I could listen to people like that. But don't come here and tell me, God, show you X, Y, Z. And none of it come to pass. And you bring your arrogant behind talking fool, but you ain't going to take back what you saw because you know what God told you. <laughs> Jacqueline Richardson, let me say this people I respect. Jacqueline Richardson, uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Minister Marva Lewis. Marva, Marva Lewis made a prediction before, a prophecy, sorry, before Hurricane Dorian. And, and I, I will brag about them all the time because, like I say, I respect you when you have your prophecy. That woman gave her prophecy. There was absolutely no sign of what she was saying would come to pass. But it came to pass to the letter. So I respect people. You don't, don't come pull no church voodoo on me and, and try to get me to be convinced even though it didn't come to pass, that don't work yet. Now, if they took your brain when you went to that particular church, I ain't gonna, they ain't going to take mine, neither will I lend you a piece of my own. That's not going to happen. See, in
Okay, we're back. All right. So it was not my internet connection. It is actually uh, StreamYard. My internet connection, internet connection is quite fine. It is StreamYard for some reason. I don't know. But anyway, let's get back to where we are, right? All right. So like I said, set time. It's a set time for for our deliverance as we did in uh, part one of our teaching. Then part two, we talk about uh, deliverance being a joint effort where we indeed cannot do deliverance on ourselves or even assisting in the lives of others. I don't care what or who we call ourselves outside of God. I went into detail on uh, Wednesday night in terms of how Jesus Christ in Matthew, John 15, sorry, literally from John 15, John 15 verses 1 to 10, I believe it is, where Jesus, in his terms of agreement, the contract that he has between us, excuse me, when we become believers and followers of him, he said, if you abide in me and me and you, whatsoever you should ask, you should receive. He also says, if you abide in me and me and you, you will produce much fruit. Here is the Father glorified that we produce much fruit. Okay? All of this here we're getting in the contract. So Jesus is saying, let me be clear again, because he would have reiterated that quite a few times. He says, you can do absolutely nothing without me. You can do nothing without me. So it brought me back to my original point. It doesn't matter which church you go to. It doesn't matter who, which church you go to or whoever the prophet or whatever may be and what they claim. Listen carefully. See, because the Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. If everything that that so-called deliverance minister, minister or prophetess or prophet, like everything is coming to them. And they're always bragging. They've been to Africa. They've been to London. They've been to Bahamas. And listen, and they have healed many people there. Or the revival broke out because of them. And before they got there, the place was doing horrible. But when they touched them, it's when they touched the, their cloth or their whatever it is, that things now begin to change. So right there, this is how you look at it. You look, you look. Now you're getting some, some something here now isn't lining up. Because as we would have read in the terms of agreement, this is where the, the joint effort now come with God and us. We are heirs with God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So when that person is always bringing the glory on them, or they touch you in your stomach and demons come out, or they slap you in the head or body slam you, or make some weird sound, or telling you to do something that is totally unconventional as it relates to the scripture. Uh, Jesus said, or they, they pollute the scriptures. Jesus said that we will tread over serpents and scorpions, and nothing shall by no uh, means harm us. So you you to a church now, and you see these fellas handling snakes around their neck and so on, and the snake bit them and they die, that's good for them. You know why? Number one, first of all, the scriptures in terms of you should trample over uh, scorpions, they, they is not talking about literal animals. These are symbolic for high-level spiritual uh, entities or deities. And furthermore, if you want to take it literal, then they should, the snake should be on the ground where you walk on it or thread on it, not put it around you and say, if this thing bites you, it wouldn't harm you because the Bible say it. So again, if you if you ain't got no sense, they're going to show up more that you ain't going to have none, period, by the time you leave there. So we have to use the Bible as a benchmark. You have to. This guy is coming to, he calling you up and he says, God is showing me where you have a, a mass on your liver or whatever. And he says, I'm, I, I need you to take two steps backwards, then spin around three times, run around. Then I need you to sow a seed. And, and 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 you're going to be delivered. I'm, I'm going to deliver you. Based on these teachings, because this was the whole purpose of it, it's getting you to analytically and carefully, do I see a partnership here as it relates to my deliverance? Or am I saying some showboat, some performer, some actor, some actress, 
who's filled with words, filled with theatrics and pageantry, only to relieve me of my monies at the end of this game. Because that's what it is. Because again, when we follow this pattern that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ left in place, you will see a constant of where he brought the word of God, brought him, because he is the word, became flesh. He taught, he preached, then you watch, then he delivered devils and healed them of disease. What, what was the prerequisite? He's giving them the word. Then the deliverance come, which now ties in with my favorite scripture, Proverbs 11, verse 9b. Through what? Through knowledge, the word of God shall the just be delivered. So Jesus in John 15 is saying the knowledge here is the contract between you and I. If you abide in me, if I in you, whatever you ask, you shall have. You are, you are asking for healing. You're asking for a breakthrough. You are, Listen what he say. Did he say? If you abide in me, sorry, if, 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 if I abide in you or whatever, and, and you sow seed into me, if you sow seed into the word of God, you will be, you didn't see that. So my question to you out there, why are you following practice that the Bible is not prescribing? Why? Why? You, you're doing it because this is what you do. You're doing it because that's a pastor. That's a bishop who's saying it. That's an apostle. And that is your problem. You're not looking at the constitution, which is the scriptures. You're not looking at the terms of agreement, which is the scriptures. You're not looking at the rules and the regulation. This is now where you begin to see for yourself now, as in looking in a mirror, that you were all along practicing full-fledged idolatry. The truth is you really thought this man could heal you. You thought Kevin could heal you. You thought Pope could heal you. So you see where the root of your problem was, and this became a constant in your life, why you wasn't getting a, a, a breakthrough, why you weren't healed. Why did your daughter die in your arms after praying with, with super miracle man for so many year, months and sowing all these seeds and, and nothing is happening because it was not the terms of agreement in the scriptures. Again, I'm going to quote what I read something Sonia Trotter wrote. Sonia Trotter said, you cannot play the game if you do not know the rules. You cannot be successful in the things of God and what it claims, the Holy Scriptures, if you do not know the rules. So, Kevin, what happens to people who don't know the rules? They subscribe to miracle clots. They subscribe to Jesus' juice. They subscribe to Jesus' jello. That's what they subscribe to. But they will never follow the rules. They're, they're, ne they're never encouraged to read the terms of agreement. Jesus says, I will heal you. I will do whatever I promise I will do for you. But you have to follow the rules. Why are you so adamant about doing everything except what the rules say? I just don't get it. How could you go to a place if they cannot wait for a particular holy day to come? This is Ash Seed Sowing Sunday. This is resurrection seed sowing. This is Passover seed. This is the 10 plague seed with a double seed of when Moses bring deliverance. This is, think about it. So, mom, why do I have to keep giving you money? Why am I purchasing something that Christ left in place for free? I don't understand that. I mean, at some point, you have to say to yourself, this make no sense. I, I, don't, I don't get it. And the reason why I don't get it, I, I could see if you didn't have a document, if you didn't have a document to tell you what you're entitled to, I would understand it. Honest to God, I would really understand it. You have a Bible, 66 books in one book giving you all of the benefits, all of the rules, the regulation, what you truly need to do. But you will curse someone like me. You will drag me in the dirt. You will say everything about this man who is giving you the rules, who is not telling you to purchase oil from him, who is not selling snake oil, who is not telling you to turn around and pimp slap your neighbor. This man is constantly pointing you to the 
rules. Why? Because he followed the rules and the rules worked for him. He is not telling you so in his ministry. He is not charging you some registration fee. Every time he wants to do a teaching, he is online. Oh, you need to come. You need to come on in. Come on in. Uh, we're going to have a teaching on Tuesday to register. You need to get in quickly if you want seating or you want to come on uh, Zoom or Skype or whatever. And that's going to be $57 registration fee. And then you have another $80. Two, if you have two kidneys, then it's $40 a piece. And, and don't worry about what all that means. It's apostolically in the realm of the spirit. Don't worry about all that. Why are you doing that? Why? So you 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 live life year after year, broke, struggling, all of this, and you you lost, Lord. What's happening to me? And God just shaking his head, boy. What's happening to you? What did I tell you in Deuteronomy, verse one, twenty eight, verse one? If you hearken unto the word of the Lord thy God and observe to do all my commandments. I will set you on high. I'm going to promote you first. That's how you know it's me working for you. And then I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. And there'll be so much blessing they will overtake. Look at all of these free things I'm accessing when I play by the rules. But you don't want that. You don't want that at all. You want somebody. You 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 hear prophet. Uh, prophet, no manifestation is coming to your city. So you can't wait to get an audience. God, you you drive into to the service in the car, Lord, Lord Jesus, Lord, Lord, let this man speak to me, Jesus. Let him talk to me tonight, because I God, I get a word from you. You don't read your Bible. They don't encourage you to read your Bible. You don't pray. You don't fast. All you want is God to give you a quick fix so now you can go deep into your sinful life and live and treat people any kind of way. That's all you want. You get there, prophet, no manifestation is standing up there waiting to give you another prophecy that will not manifest. Hence, he is called prophet, no manifestation. And he calls you up out of the crowd again. Woman of God, come here. I don't know. I, 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 I see you asking God to give you a word. That's what I see. Glory be to Jesus. And the word of the Lord to you is, I hear God says that, that, Finances are low. I, I see finances are low, and I see where you're struggling. Okay, I see where you're struggling. Now you see these two little PZA children you got on the side of you. I see where where you don't get much help with the kids. Glory be to God, because you see the children ain't attired properly. So he he just feeding his way through this. God says you gotta make a. I see because two children is double sacrifice. That's what I'm seeing. That's double sacrifice, and 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 I'm I'm, I'm gonna go now. I'm gonna go back to 1902, and God is showing me where your great great grandfather. All right. What he did is he uh, he he didn't read the full book of Matthew. He only stopped in the middle. And God said, it's because of that. Oh, glory to God. I see. Nonsense. You like that. And you can stand up there and you can look at, oh, 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 give me a blessing, blah, blah, blah. Why don't you just read the Bible? Why don't you just say, Lord, give me understanding? Why don't you say, Lord, lead me to real teachers and preachers of your word who could really teach me the rules to this game? You won't do that. So that's why I said to you in our part two, which was uh, deliverance is a set time part two. Deliverance is a joint effort. The joint effort is in order for God to work through me, then I need to abide by the terms of, of agreement that is settled in his word. And like he said, whatever you ask for, you shall receive. Then you might say, well, Kevin, if you say whatever I ask for, I will receive then how could there be set times? No, because if you go into to that constitution and Jesus Christ is in you, listen what he says in Philippians 2 and 13. He says, it's, it, is, it is him willing in you to do of his good pleasure. So the real Jesus in you, who is following the terms and agreement and you in a service and you're the speaker or whatever, and now he's willing in you. This has happened to me many times where he will say, that person right there, call them up right now. And you begin to say stuff to this person that you you kind of saying to yourself, well, I hope I write here. And this person says to you, everything you told me is true. Why? Because it is God willing, not no clown, God willing, not no familiar spirit, God willing in you at that set time to distribute deliverance for this person. Now it brings us to today's teaching. Couldn't wait to get here. Today's teaching Again, we're back with There is a Set Time for Deliverance Part 3. And our subtopic is the laws and rules of deliverance. Boy, again, y'all going to love this today. The laws and rules of deliverance. 
the laws and rules of deliverance. Boy, we can have a good time. I hope you guys have your pen. We have a lot of scriptures and notes that we're going to take here. Let me just pull up my stuff here. The laws and rule of deliverance. All righty. Now, I have said to you on any number of occasions that everything, everything that exists, that which is living or dead, that which is visible or invisible, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness, our physical planes, the galaxies, everything and how it behaves and function, there are rules and laws and principles that's governing not just its existence, but its ability to perform the way it was designed to perform. The moon and the sun and the stars and the different planets, they're not just suspended in the galaxy because they could. There are laws that are causing them to not just be there, but there's a consistency of it that's causing them not to buck up. Same thing that on our planet, same thing as it relates to stuff as simple as uh, a relationship, marriages, on the job, the way that the different systems in your body operates, your circulatory system, your, your, your digestive system. Everything is operating by a rule. And I guess go back to what Sonia said. In order to 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 perform this game or to be this game or to be successful, you have to know the rules. So what do you do when your systems in your body seems not to be acting right? Then you send them to someone who is an expert at the systems as it relates to your body. Who's that expert in terms of the rules of that? A doctor. When your car is constantly losing power, these different lights are coming on. What do you do? Do you send your car to a carpenter? Do you send your car to the pastor to be fixed? Do you send your car to the electrician? No, you don't. You send them to a place that are experts at the laws and the rules of and the principles as it relates to that car. With that said, when we're dealing with deliverance, remember what I said. It's a set time, night one, night two. There's a joint effort with it. This last night we're dealing with the what are the what are the rules that are in place? Because now when I begin to lay out these rules and articulate them to you, I want you to now go back in time and now look at those so-called deliverance prophets and ministers and apostles who did a bunch of nonsense on stage trying to impress people. And let's see if what the rules of the scriptures, because that's what I'm getting them from, let's see if the rules of the scriptures they were lining up with. I told you about this guy. Uh, <laughs> this is such a joke. This this prophet came here to Grand Bahama, where I live, in the Bahamas. And at the time, I was affiliated with a particular church, and the pastor had asked me to accompany him because this was his friend's church, and they were having a few nights of revival with this invited guest. This is a, this is a black American guy. So anyway, I I, uh, I went I went with him. I accompanied him. And of course, when we came in, uh, we were... You know, brought to the front, sat rest to the front. So this guy, <laughs> I told this story before. This guy was wearing this a red, like a rhinestone jacket. But that was on the part that got me. He had on these red snakeskin pointed shoes. So he spent the next thirty to forty minutes talking about these anointed shoes that he's wearing. Excuse me, and that he don't ever wear these shoes. Watch this now. On a regular, like he wouldn't wear them outside. It's only when he's in the church and he's getting ready to prophesy, he puts these on, right? He said, because these shoes do not touch the dirt outside. So I'm sitting there, again, remember now, remember what I told you earlier, pride of all of these, the churches that I went to, pride to remember I was in study, I was engulfing and consuming the scriptures. That was me. I was a tester of the scriptures, meaning that you better say sense because I'm writing this down. And my and the spirit in me, the spirit of God, that it's the Holy Spirit, which I'm constantly feeding through the word of God, and my human spirit is analytically going through these things that you're saying. So he said he has never walked on the outside with these shoes. And apparently his, the, his, the reason for him saying that was that I guess they have some special anointing. So now I'm thinking, okay, is he saying that the anointing is in his shoe? Because why is he going on with all of this? 
So he he basically he basically in, in a nutshell was saying that because of the shoes that he's wearing, he is able to I guess perform the way that he he performs. So again, when we look at it, what what is he talking about? What what? So you're telling me you've reduced the terms of agreement, but you clearly know nothing of, where you've excluded Jesus. And now you're saying that you and the shoe, once you put the shoe on, there's an anointing that comes upon you. Forget you, Jesus. We don't need you. The anointing comes from this shoe. And you're going to hear people, but not forget all of that. You saying you don't walk outside in these shoes. You change them. As soon as you get up on the pulpit, you take off your shoe that you wore previously and you put on this super anointed Holy Ghost snakeskin pointy mode shoe. So tell me something. Maybe I'm stupid. Maybe I'm ignorant. Won't they be won't there be dirt particles on that church's floor from the myriad of people that traffic in and out of there? So wouldn't your wouldn't your shoe make con even though you didn't make contact outside? Wouldn't your shoe make contact with the dirt and the stuff on the floor in there? But this is the part that get me people. People are actually clapping. People are actually saying amen. To what? What, what scripture did he say? What did he say that warranted amen? What did he say to say praise you? You hear what he's telling you? So again, what it showed me was another stage, another level of church ignorance in the sense that what come there and say, you're a man of God, you say some riddles that is normally in they're used to, and now you could just utter garbage from there. And no matter what you say, they're going to go for it. So you could be preaching. Now here God said, hmm, the two puppies got shot. Preach it. Go. Lord, you're on fire tonight. You're on fire tonight. And I hear the billy goat saying, hmm. Then the horse came. Come on now. And when the horse and the goat come together, help me preach this thing right now. I feel my help coming on. And God. So you see what I'm saying? Church is like their program that once you say you're a prophet, we are not interested in the terms of agreement. We are not interested in measuring you up to the word of God. Once you got that tone and once you could play that stupid games, we are going to praise the Lord for you. You are a man of God because we're walking out here tonight that the two billy goats got killed in the road. And when the car hit them, the impact vibrated the atmosphere and the second heavens, glory be to God, was on fire. And it rained down the blessings from the billy goat sacrifice. Oh, help me preach this thing right now. Now you see what I'm saying to you? No, everybody is just accustomed to saying amen, hallelujah, jump up, start doing the cabbage patch, and the, the glory of God is here. But when we analytically go through what he said, this dude just tell us the two billy goats was passing the road, and when sheep probably get shot in his head, and two ducks decided to hang themselves over the highway, and you're saying glory to God for that. Boy, I I have enough. I I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Let's go to Proverbs eleven verse six. Let's go to Proverbs eleven verse six. You know, I'm trying to challenge you, man. You want change, right? You want change, like just like me. When I was going through my go through, God made it clear to me: if you want something different, you got to do something different. You can't be in a place that's preaching stupidness and dung, and everything is a show. Every revival and conclave and conference is all a show. That's it. You bring in a prophet who know how to raise money, who probably got a degree in sales and marketing, and he know he know the average things that people go through. He know, listen, I could be the biggest sin in the world, and I could play that game. I could come right there, stand up on the pulpit, and I, and I said, there, there's somebody in here. Watch how general this is. There's somebody in here. I don't know who you are. <sighs> but you have trouble in your life. I don't know who you are. There, I, I, God is showing me there is trouble. <laughs> I see heads bucking in families. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hear, I hear, I, I can hear your family members talking about you. Glory be to Jesus. Glory to God. I see 
Oh, Lord, I thank you for this. Oh, I thank you, Simon of Samaria, because you couldn't be talking about the Holy Spirit. Simon of Samaria is telling me that when you leave here tonight, there will be a transition at the stoplight from green to red. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Who, who, who is that? Who is that? Come here. Do, do, do I know you? Have we met before? What I'm saying to you people, and, and I keep making these sarcastic stuff with the seriousness of this message, because I want to show you the amount of time you have wasted, the amount of time you've sat in these circus arenas. But all, and let me be clear here, you are not going to get such a performance without coming up with a seat afterwards. They're not going to let you get out of there without paying for that performance, that foolishness that you sat there and listened to. You see the transition of the red light going into the amber and the green. What are you talking about? And again, what does this have to do with deliverance? What does this have to do with my Jesus? What does this have to do with a better relationship with him? What does it, all you're doing is what the regular charlatan does. You are trying to center everything about you. That's why you said, have we met before? Did we have this conversation? Do you know me? Why are you trying to bring all the attention to you? Can't you not give me some scriptures? Pray the word of God over me? Something of that nature. You cannot because that's not your agenda. You are a clown. You are a puppet. You are an actor. You are an actress. And you don't, you don't, you know the pulse of the people in here. The preachers have them ignorant. They're not preaching the word. All oh, they got them high on is prophecy and deliverance and dream interpretation. But don't ever teach them the Bible. Get out of here with that nonsense, man. Foolishness. And you sit there and you're wondering, you, you, how old are you now? 40? You're 45? You're 50? 50. No man, no children. You've been wearing these long white outfit all the way, not by your, 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 your ankle, under your foot to, to, to represent purity and you don't fornicate and you don't this. You know something? You did something worse than it had you fornicate. You allow them, you allow them to do a brain transplant on you. You dismiss the word of God and listen to the words of men. So I don't feel sorry for you. You get exactly what you deserve. Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 6. Listen to this. This is so powerful. People, wake up, yeah? Wake up. Don't let tragedy come and say, boy, I wish I had to listen to Kevin. Wake up. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 6. <sighs> the righteousness of the upright, I love this, shall deliver them. Mm. But the transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. Now listen to this carefully. The righteousness of the upright. What is the righteousness? I explained this on many occasions before. Righteousness as it relates to God's kingdom and us means us doing things the God-ordained way of doing it. For example, we should not have sex before marriage, but I'm sure more than 99% of us fail that one. So right to, so so not to do that, not to tell lies, to be kind and loving to your neighbor, to pray for your enemies, even though they're do, they, even though they're cursing you, these are the prescriptions of the Holy Scripture. In engaging them, you are now in you're walking in righteousness or the God ordained way of doing things. Okay, I hope I explained that well for you. Now, why is this important? Because the scripture says the righteousness of the upright. If you keep doing the will of God, which is the word of God, what I keep telling you, I said to you, if you follow the principles and the rules of God, that will automatically take you into your destiny, right? It's bringing more sight here when you follow the rules. And following the rules meaning that you're walking in righteousness. It is saying here, the righteousness of the upright, the just, the saved one, shall deliver them. But let's see what we are not seeing here. It didn't say the miracle clot of the upright. It didn't say the upright who sowed seed. It didn't say the upright who carried a pastor the Bible and he's some armor bearer, some security, whatever. Why are we doing things that is not required to bring the deliverance that we want? When the scriptures are extremely clear as to what we need to do to get the results that scripture promises us. I, I just don't get that. If you tell your children, now, now, Tom and Mary, now listen, 
I'm going to work today. And Mary, I want you to sweep the rooms, make up the bed. Tom, I want you to mop the floor, wash the, the dishes. If you guys do that, here is the deal. If you follow these rules, when I get back home, we'll have dinner tonight, and I'll take you for ice cream on Sunday. Simple, right? Simple rules. So parents came back home. None of it, none of it was done. None of it. Should they be rewarded? Should they still get the promise? No, they shouldn't. Because the arrangement was, based on the terms of agreement, that if you do what I required you to do, then this would be the benefit or the promise of, of, of or the results of, of had you done what you're supposed to do, right? Very simple, very straightforward, very clear. How is it then? The scriptures are telling you, you who are upright, you who know God, the first rule, through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Are you the just? Yes, I am. Are you the righteous? It's all, all synonymous with each other. He said that the knowledge of God, which is the terms of agreement in order for God to do what he promised that he was going to do for you. If I follow this, if I do this, then deliverance is going to become the inevitable. Excuse me. Remember what I told you. When I was going through fasting and praying and following the rules, and it seems like nothing was happening, I was experiencing deliverance and didn't realize it until months later. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't have this lust spirit no more. I don't have the spirit of confusion and anxiety no more. What's going on here? Why? All I had to do was follow the rules, follow the principles, follow the laws of God. And the scripture, it is automatic that I will be delivered. So what does this really mean? I can knock your socks off right now. <sighs> to seek a deliverance minister should be the last resort for you. Because what he is going to do is exactly what you should have done. But you're going there because you don't want to read. You don't want to study. You don't want to fast. You just want to hook up with somebody who got some anointing on them, who's working with God, of course, to bring about your deliverance. So years are going on and you're suffering unnecessarily because you do not want to follow the rules. It's as simple as that. There's no two way you could put it. So therefore, when you're watching these deliverance ministers doing foolishness, kung fu, karate, somersaulting, having lengthy conversations with demons and taking reservations for the Marriott when they travel, all of this which has nothing to do with the rules. Sonia said, you cannot play the game if you don't know the rules. The righteousness of the upright shall, I love that word, shall. If you continue walking uprightly, if you continue, if you make a... And listen, walking uprightly, let me be clear here, let me be clear, does not mean that you are perfect. You might fall one, two, three, ten, a million times. The Bible say a just man fall at seven times and do what? Get back up again. Ecclesiastes 7 say what? There is no righteous man upon this earth that sinneth not. This scripture... God isn't looking for how much time you fall. God wants to see how committed you are. Do you really believe in my word? Are you really convinced that my word is me? The word is Jesus Christ who was manifested in flesh. If you believe that, then do your best to follow it. And in following it, you will automatically see these things shared off of your life. The spirit of rejection, the spirit of hopelessness, the spirit of defeat. But it cannot happen if you are following some nonsense some preacher tells you to do. Go down by the beach and drink all the salt water and take the sun and, and stuff it in your ears. And now you do the fire roll and I see God is going to deliver you. Where can I find this in the rules? Please. Just once. Show it to me in the rule books and you got me. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but the transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. Let's look at Proverbs 12, verse 6. I love this one. Proverbs 12, verse 6 says, The words of the wicked are to lie and wait for blood. Listen now. Listen to this. I like this piece. So there's Proverbs 
chapter 12, 6b. But the mouth of the upright shall deliver him. Whoa, 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 whoa. Make me understand that. The mouth of the upright shall deliver him. The, the, sorry, the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. Why is this? How could my mouth deliver me or even them? Because along with us practicing the rules, we're declaring the rules. This, this makes a lot of sense because the scripture says, a man shall eat good by the fruit of his lips. The scripture says in Proverbs 18 and 21, death and life reside in the power of the tongue. So if death and life reside here, I'm not just speaking words. I'm either activating something or terminating it. So he says, but the one who is going to bring deliverance, clearly he's speaking positive. Clearly he's speaking what he want to see. Primarily he's speaking the unadulterated words, rules, and terms of the contract, which is the Holy Scriptures, the Constitution. Every true deliverance of the master, his, his hope, his foundation, and everything about him is embedded in the Scriptures. And he gives all honor and glory to the one who's giving him the power, who's, who, whom he's working along with, which is the Savior. So the first rule of thumb, if this person claimed to be a prophet or prophetess and they're always bragging, oh, I, my prophecies always come true. Uh, I don't know about the rest of them, but when I speak, glory be to God, you know, they come true all the time. Or he's saying that, you know, no one in here could be healed unless it's through me. Or he's saying, I, this is a famous one, if you leave this church under this apostolic covering, you're cursing, you can't prosper. Really? Really? I read in the times of agreement, let's go back over it again. John 15, several times Jesus reiterated this. If you abide in me and I in you, whatever you do, whatever you ask for, I will do. If you abide in me and I in you, he says you will produce more fruit. Who are you going to believe? What Jesus said or what this joker is telling you over here? That if you leave his covering, you ain't going to prosper. So more than 90% of you all in church are to fail. Oh, I don't want to go. Because we see what Pastor did to the rest when they left. When he threw all kind of jazz and shade from the pulpit. That's why they can't prosper. They left under this, this anointing, this Jerry Curl anointing. And I told them because they, they, they doubted me because they, they saw my Jerry Curl drying up. They didn't know I had two cans. I couldn't find home to spray on this thing so that anointing could come back. Glory be to uh, Caesar them. <laughs> No, man, give me the rules. You can't intimidate me. You can't fool me. I ain't stupid. I can read. And once what I'm reading, once what I'm reading does not line, that what you say don't line up with this, boy, I, I don't respect you. I don't listen to you. Because what you're doing now, that's what you're going to do, to get me to turn or get, uh, away from the rules. And these are the only ingredients needed to, to, to recycle my failure. Get out of here with that garbage. Get out of here with that. Get out of here with that. Get out of here. So you you listening to me right now, you you haven't, you've been begging for deliverance, you've been begging God for a breakthrough, you've been doing all kinds of stuff, and nothing is happening to you. Maybe they might set time, or maybe your set time been coming and going because you put your confidence, you put your faith in a mere mortal who was telling you garbage to take your money, but never leading you to the scriptures, never leading you to the terms of agreement. Boy, you all better wake up, boy. Wake up. Wake up. Let's look at some more laws. They were the laws on deliverance, right? Let's look at some more spiritual laws. Proverbs chapter 3. This is These are the things that is going to happen automatically when we follow God's specific rules. Proverbs chapter 3. Let's look at that. Proverbs chapter 3. And we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 2. These are the rules. Proverbs chapter 3. And we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 2. My son... Forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Not the policies of your church, not how pastor them do it. They are not greater than God. I am not greater than God. How, how could you reduce the power of God to a mere model? They, the, God put them there as a pastor, as a teacher, as an apostle, as a prophetess, as an evangelist, as a bishop, to point you to him. 
to point you to the rules. Any church that is spending more time raising different names of seed as opposed to pointing you to the rules is a demon church. Take it from me. Synagogue of devil, a den of thieves, according to scripture. Not my opinion. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. The scripture. And what's going to happen? What's going to happen if I keep the rules? What's going to happen if I keep the laws? What, what, are, what are some of the benefits? Well, watch what he says in verse 2. As a result of keeping my laws, as a result of keeping your, my commandments in your heart, he says, for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Whoa, 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 whoa. Because there's another constant I'm not seeing. And what's that constant, Mr. Ewing? Why am I not seeing I have to put a seed? And watch this now. Watch this. Watch this. This, 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 this sales pitch. Don't just give us your seed, but put your name on the seed. Put my name on the seed. What, where, where, where I can find it again? Put my name on the seed. So you, you now you tell, first of all, God was broke. To, he got to keep the lights on in heaven. Now you're telling me he ain't smart now. He wouldn't even know. If I don't put my name on the seed or what I want the seed to do, he don't. Again, you are going against the laws of God. Why do I have to tell an apple seed to grow apples? Why do I have to tell an orange seed to produce orange? So what do you mean I must put or name my seed? Don't just put the seed, and the seed it ain't mean is money. Don't just come give us the money, pray and say, God, take the seed and do this with it for me. You are a liar because the scripture says to us, Genesis 1 verse 11 or verse 12, what does it say? What is the law of the seed? It says that every seed produces after its kind. I don't have to tell an apple seed produce apple. So what you saying, pastor? What you saying, prophetess? Why are you giving rules that the scripture does not include?
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I can't say what's happening here. But this thing is just going in and out. Okay, I don't know what's happening. But anyway, <clears throat> we're going to continue. All right? Hope you guys can hear me. Okay. All right. Great. Okay, great. All right. So, like I was saying, right, the scriptures are very clear. It's not asking us to do any, uh, uh, perform any additional requirements. It's very simple. And as we're reading here from Proverbs 3, verses 1 to 2, where we are admonished in verse 1 to keep the commandments of God, to keep the laws and the rules of God. And one of the benefits, or well, a few other benefits, he says, that length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. So the scripture is saying as a believer, or one who is following the rules, there are cadre of other rules in the scriptures. But I'm only pointing out some to you that will extend. You want to have your life extended, okay? You want long days. But not only that, you don't just want to have an extended life with misery. You want an extended life with peace. So the scripture says to achieve that, it says here, do not forget the laws of God. In fact, keep them, keep the commandments in your heart. Now, again, let's look at what it's not telling us to do. It's not telling us to go pin $100 on pastor. And, and again, I, mean, I have to make these disclaimers. I'm not saying don't bless your pastor. I'm, not, I'm telling you what is not a requirement. I'm telling you that if they try to make you feel guilty because you didn't do it for whatever reason, this is not a requirement by the scriptures to achieve the promises of God. So I'm not saying to you, don't give to the church, don't give to the pastor. I'm saying to you, what they made a rule or part of their policy in you being there is not scripture. It is the scripture that's going to extend our days. It's going to, the scripture that's going to give us peace. So it's the scriptures that we need to look at. Let's go at Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6 verse 23. Listen to what it says. Do this now, my son. Sorry, Proverbs 6 verse 23, right? It says, for the commandment, the commandment which is the commands of God, the commandment is a lamp, I told you this before, and the law is a light. So the scriptures is now giving us this, this imagery. And it says, the commandment of the Lord, all of them, not just the Ten Commandments, all, com all whatever you are commanded to do in the Bible, that is relevant for the data is. Because they were commanded to cut open sheep and so on for a tomb, and we don't do that no more. Excuse me. So whatever is relevant for today, according to scriptures, he says the when, when we do the commandments, or the commandment, sorry, is a light, is a lamp, sorry, and the law is a light. In both cases, when it causes us to, to imagine or to bring the scripture to life, and what it's saying here, it's saying the commandments and the laws of, of God are, are light, but what do we need light for? Do we need light on a sunny day? Do we need light at 12 noon when the sun is at its peak sometimes? No. So the only reason why we would need light is in darkness. Hence, we take that understanding and now we bring it back to the scripture. So if the scripture is saying that the commandments is a lamp and the law is the light in that lamp, then it's telling us that the purpose of us uh, adhering to the commandment and the law, it becomes that light that's taking us on our destiny, and this dark destiny is showing us what, where the obstacles are ahead, what, what's going to block us, because if I see it, I know how to divert from it. So this scripture only adds what I've been telling you. When you follow the laws of God, it's going to automatically take you to your destiny. It's going to um, automatically deliver you. You don't have to pray for deliverance. Just do the scriptures. Just do the laws of God. That's it. You don't have to do none of those tricks you see, and you don't have to go through all of that. Out, out, get out of me, poof, poof, demon, come out, uh, demon. You, you don't have to do none of that because it's not a requirement. No. Any church or religious institution that's adding stuff or taking away stuff as it relates to the scriptures is a place you need to get far away from. Any church where you have to worship leadership and they're the, the grand master prophet, the chief apostle, the boss prophet, the prophet of the 23rd century, the futuristic prophet, the master prophet. 
When you hear stuff like that, these are all red flags. Jesus' ministry was embedded and foundationalized in humility. Well, who, who, who gave you the title of ma? How do you get, how do you get a master prophet? <laughs> no, no, wow. That's a heavy call. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light and reproof of instructions out of ways of life. Okay, so let's go to Proverbs 13, verse 14. Proverbs 13, verse 14. Listen to what it says here. Proverbs 13, verse 14 says, The law of the wise, uh-huh, is a fountain of life. Wow, you hear that? The law of the, if, if I, and the law will always be the law. Whenever you hear the word law, commandments, ordinance, these are all simultaneously with the Bible. Okay, the law, okay, for you, legalists out there, I am not talking only about the five, sorry, the ten commandments. I am not talking about the laws from Genesis to Deuteronomy. Let me be clear again. When I speak about the laws, the rules, and the principles of God from Genesis to Revelation, like I'm reading right now in, De in, in Proverbs, I'm reading scriptural rules and principles to you. So verse 14 of Proverbs 13 says, the law of the wise is a fountain of life. Uh-huh. It's a fountain of life. It's, it's, it's a fountain that is constantly descending life on you. And what is it going to do, Mr. Ewing? Well, according to the scripture, the law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. So what this means is that no matter how much traps are set for me in the future, no matter who conspires against me, just like the scripture says, no matter what weapons have been formed, if I am following the laws of God, if I am not convinced stupidly to believe that I could give monies to some preacher, put it on his or her account, or put it on the church's account, or put it on the altar, and somehow God is going to say, okay, Kevin, I see you put a pretty penny there, so you don't need to abide by this law. So don't worry about the commandment being a lamp and the law being a light. For you, because you gave $2,000, to my man or woman servant, I'm going to exempt you from the law. Which scripture can we find that? See, and this is when you, now mind you, I am not coming down on you. I'm coming down on me too. I used to do that. I used to, but they had me convinced. They had me convinced that if you give this seed, if you give this seed, and it was just seed after seed, you, you couldn't keep money because you always had to give a seed. But Giving the seed wasn't the problem, you know. The problem was I wasn't seeing the benefit or I couldn't say, for example, let's say over the years of going to church, let's say in sowing seed, I gave over 100,000. Let's just say, I probably even give more, but let's just say, right? I don't have a house to show for it. I don't have no education. Not, see, if, 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 if I pay off a student loan and I've been paying for years and I'm frustrated, but the benefit of that is I have a degree. If you pay in the bank for a 20-year mortgage, the benefit of that, you're going to get a house. These places, so-called churches, would claim that seed, 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 what do you get in return? Other than a promise and a pie in the sky. Other than that, what do you get? And if you said nothing, well, that's good for you. You deserve it, which was the same for me. Until you come into the scriptures where you don't have to do those things that they're requiring you to do and just follow the simple law. Show me, if, I, if someone could point to me, where did Jesus, if someone could show me, I have studied the ministry of Jesus, the, th the three years he had from age 30 to age 33 when he died. I have studied that intensely, trying to find somewhere where I could see the pattern that I see today, the seed sowing doctrine, the covering doctrine, none of that I could find. And that is the pattern we're supposed to follow, Jesus Christ. But everyone is gung-ho on getting rich off somebody, ride money, and we treat them like royalty. We make sure they have the best while we suffer. Where did you get that concept from? The kingdom of God is a commonwealth. Everyone should prosper. Boy, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. I, boy, I don't know. Anyway, let me, let me, let me, let me get to my point now. Okay. So listen to this. The law of the wise, it's very clear here. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart, to cause you to take a different direction from the snares of death. Very, 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 very clear. Let's go now to Proverbs. I like this one. Proverbs 28 verse 4. Proverbs 28 and verse 4. Listen to what it says. 
I love this. Now we're getting deep now. Now you're going to see a lot of your errors and why certain things wasn't panning out. It says here in Proverbs 28 verse 4, they that forsake the law. Mm, so what does this mean, Kevin? To forsake the law, meaning that God is saying to you, he gave you specific commandments. He said to give to the poor, Kevin. He says, help those that are less fortunate. Then he went into some more specific rules. He says, now, Kevin, let me be clear with you. I want to show you how serious this poor business is. I keep reiterating to you. If you give, if you oppress the poor and give to the rich, he says, you shall become poor. Let me be clear here. I'm telling you over and over, when you're giving, you give to, don't, don't look for who you could get something from. Meet the need of somebody else because this is how I'm going to meet your need. What you do for others, I will do for you. This is all through scripture. So you said, no, I don't want to hear that law. I want this new doctrine we have in church, seed sowing doctrine. So I want to follow my apostle, whatever, and they says that if you give to the Lord or them or whatever, and God is going to bless you, blah, blah, blah. But, but that's not what I'm reading. So now listen, listen the curse you brought on yourself through your disobedience. They that forsake the law, what are you going to do? You're going to praise the wicked. I'm going to praise my bishop. He or she or whoever they call themselves, they're raping me financially every week. There's not a time we could come in here where we don't hear about tithes and offering and seed and seed and seed and seed. Every time we come in here. But what I'm going to do, because I'm forsaking the law of giving to the poor and giving to the less fortunate and helping other people, I will continually praise the one who is breaking the laws. That's what the scripture is saying. They that forsake the law praise the wicked. But watch now, this is where I come in. But such as keep the law will contend with them. There you go. My platform here, and what do I do here? I push the word of God. And when I push the word of God, I mean I got to call out some folk. And the folk is, and I'm not calling no name, what I'm calling out is what you're doing is against the scripture. So the Bible says those that obey, Kevin, those that obey, you whoever obeying, you, you, got a, you have a right now to contend with those that are trying to pull the rest away from the laws. Scripture. Go read it. Right there. I didn't put it there. I didn't put it there. I didn't put it there. Scripture's there. Let's read it again. They that forsake the law. See, because when you forsake the law, you're misguided now. You, 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 you have no, no, no moral compass no more. You just do their rules and their policies from that particular religious organization. But you will never follow the rules of God. So it's okay now when you say that, oh, you know what, stealing, sorry, lying is not really a sin. If it's going to cost someone their life, then you should tell lies. Glory to God. You know, God is, that's not what the scriptures say, sir. That's not what I read in the scriptures. They that forsake the law. How are you going to know those who forsaken the law? Those who call right wrong and wrong right. That's scripture. They that forsake the law, uh -huh, how are we going to know Jesus? They will praise the wicked. That's what I'm reading here. They that forsake the law will praise the wicked, but such as keep the law, you will now contend or challenge those that break it. That's what I'm reading here, right? I mean, that is what the scripture is saying, right? That's what the scripture is saying. So let's hold this because we can pound on this right now. Okay, let's use the false prophets now. The false prophet says that uh, last year, well, not, not, yeah, last year, I heard some fake prophets saying last year is going to be the most devastating hurricane season ever in the entire lifespan of life. None of it happened. None of it happened. So let's see what the Bible say now. Even with the three days of darkness, these liars coming on you saying God says to put plastic on your window. And even these other liars we got here in the Bahamas who say put on the red cloth. Liars. They are liars. And I could boldly say it. I could bold. I, got, I say it with confidence. I don't care if it's your mother. She's a liar. Because the scripture gives us the benchmark on how to judge them. So now let's go to Deuteronomy 18. We can read this very clearly. See, everybody will come bring their feelings in this. So don't you say it about my bishop. I never call you. I don't even know your bishop's name. But clearly what I said is the word of God. What convicted you, and now you won't come with this uh, damage control committee over here. Don't, don't come with that. Deuteronomy 18. Let's read from verse 21 to 22. Because they say, do not touch God's anointed. You should fear the prophet. If he make a prophecy, and whether or not it come to pass, you should fear him. That's not a scripture. That's not the law. That's not the rules that I was given to assess him by. Let's now read the rules. 
The rules say here in Deuteronomy 18 verse 21, as it relates to prophets and them saying that they have a word from God. In verse 21 of Deuteronomy 18, And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord had spoken? How do we know that what you're telling us is from the Lord and it's going to come to pass? How do we, how do we determine that? Well, verse 22 will tell you of Deuteronomy 18. It says, when a prophet speak in the name of the Lord, very clear, if the thing follow not, meaning that what they predicted did not come to pass, if the thing followed not, nor come to pass, that is the thing, that is the thing, uh huh, which the Lord, okay, had not spoken. Very clear, right? Very clear. Watch, it, is, it isn't done. But the prophet had spoken it presumptuously. Sorry, pre presumptuously. Listen, listen, because they tell you, do not touch God's anointed. It says, thou, those whom he predicted this to, those who was listening, shall not be afraid of him. Scripture. Scripture. I read in Scripture there. Yeah. Now, I don't know what you're reading, but I'm going by the Scripture. But they that forsake the Lord, those that forsake this, the idol worshippers, don't touch God's anointed. You stop putting your mud on my pastor. Why are you bashing the pastor? Whoa, 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 whoa. So you're telling me to discard this. You're telling me to turn a blind eye to the word of God and be hopeless like you and be broke like you and stay looking for pies in the skies like you while your pastors and those get rich. Don't you try that? You will never get me to go against the word of God, especially when I've read it and understand it. The scriptures are clear, very clear. Let's read it again. And if thou say in thine heart, this is the 21st verse of Deuteronomy 18. If thou say in thine heart, how, how shall we know the word which the Lord had, had not spoken? How are we going to know this is not of God or this is of God? How, God, what is the benchmark? Will the sky turn yellow? Will, will a volcano erupt? Will a tsunami come? No, that's not going to happen. Here is here's your assessment and also where you judge them. Verse 22 says, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord have not spoken. But the prophet had spoken it presumptuously. Thou shall not fear him. The guy prophesied three nights of darkness and he went in detail with the dates and he said to get the black garbage bag and put it to your windows and all this other stuff. He comes back after didn't happen and listen what he says. He will not apologize for the prophecy because he stands to the prophecy. But the Lord in a twist showed him that the reason why the prophecy didn't come to pass why it didn't come to pass? Because the people had repented. So you're telling me the God who was all-knowing didn't know in advance that before the three days of darkness, the people were going to uh, 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 repent? He didn't know that? You catch him off guard? And now I'm reading the comments under his false prophecy, and they're telling him, be encouraged. So you see, those that forsake the law will praise the wicked. Did you not read that? Did you not see it come to pass? Those that forsake the law will praise the wicked. Those that forsake the Lord will call good evil and evil good. Because they're not interested in the rules. They're not interested in the laws. They're not interested in follow the, the commandments and the ordinance of God. They're not, they don't care about that. That's my prophet. That's my pastor. That's my teacher, Kevin. That's my apostle. Forget you, God. I believe this man. And if anybody wrong, God is you. Because that's what they're saying. And you're just as foolish supporting people like that. No, man. Don't get mad at me. Because the Bible said, They that forsake the law shall praise the wicked. But those who do it will contend with them.
to try that. See, because when they contend, they ain't coming to be right. People like me, we ain't coming to be right, you know. We coming to show people like you who probably never read these things. This is what you need to be using as your benchmark. I'm not looking to be right. I'm not looking to show up somebody. That's not the purpose of the scriptures. The scriptures is that you would have an understanding like myself or even better to now walk righteously to invite the promises of God to be manifested in your life. But it will not happen if you're not following the rules and people polluting it by asking you for seed to circumvent the rules. It will never happen. It will never ever happen in this life. So the Bible says to, it tells you, he says, that prophet is not of me. And don't fear him. Don't let nobody tell you, touch not God's so anointing. You've got every right to touch him. He's a fake fraud, phony, and a think. He's not of God. The Bible tells you how to deal with those who enter darkness. Don't let these uh, misquoters tell you nonsense. Let's go to Ephesians 5 verse 11 because it's going to give us more instructions how we deal with these workers of iniquity, these slow belly devils. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, what does it say? Oh, let me see. Maybe it said, touch not God's anointed when they're giving you false prophecy. Let them guide you to the road of Tehel. Proverbs 5, sorry, Ephesians 5, verse 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful. Unfruitful mean those who are not producing fruit. Jesus said in his terms of agreement in John 15, he said, those who do not produce fruit, he cuts off and they wither away and they're gathered up and burn. That sounds like touching not God's anointed to you. The scripture is now giving us more instructions on how to deal with these people, lying apostles and prophets and all these other people. Ephesians 5 verse 11 says, and you should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. What you prophesied did not come to pass. It was unfruitful. You are consistent with this. The scriptures, the constitution is saying to me, Kevin and whoever else have air to hear, listen to what God says. Obey his commandments. He says, you must have nothing to do with those who are constantly getting it wrong. But he didn't finish with that. So God, how do we do with them? Because they say, touch not God's anointed and do his prophets no harm. We've been, every time we come against these jokers, God, you got to give us, oh, listen to what I say now. Not them, listen to what I say. The Lord, listen to what the Lord say. Do not have any affiliations with those who are unfruitful, but, but here is how you deal with them. But rather reprove them, correct them, expose them. Why? Why should we do that? That's not nice. You know the church are going to defend them. You do it because you don't want them to lead others to a Christless hell. You don't want others worshiping them. That's why you do it. So I will call them out for every time. Don't get mad at me. You said the prophecy. I didn't say a prophecy. You said the prophecy and the prophecy did not come to pass. So you want me to develop a damage control committee to protect you. The truth is you want me to lie for you. You should stand, if you say God tell you this, according to what we read, God told us, if what he said, which was of me, didn't come to pass, what he, what he, what he said? What, what did he say to do to you? Don't fear you. And what you said was not of him. In Deuteronomy 13, uh, it got, got worse than that. He said when they, don't, when they prophesy lies or, or their source of their prophecies coming from other gods, he said the prophet should be put to death. But I see why you always use the amendment, uh, uh, touch not God's anointing, because you all know what really is supposed to happen. You're supposed to get your hair take off for misleading people, and you made them sow a seed in that prophecy. That's what you did. You said sow a seed in this prophecy that did not come to pass. So can I get a refund on my seed? Hello. <laughs> can it is only fair that you give me my money back because you, 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 you got me to buy into something that did not produce. But yet you're mad with me. So I'm saying this to show you how deliverance operate. You may not be getting deliverance, not so much even that you have missed your time, but you will continue to miss those appointed deliverance time for, for, because whom you're following, you more 
you believe more in them, you fear them more, you honor them more, you respect them more, you are more committed to what they, their version of the scriptures than the scripture itself who has given what is given you, what was given to you by God to produce fruit in your life. So what am I saying? I'm saying you are an idolater. You, you are into adultery. Kevin, how could I be into adultery? Because you honor a creation. You honor a person's word. You honor their beliefs more than you honor the word of God. Now you see why no deliverance happened. Now you see why you're still in the same position you was in for 20 years. 20 years you are a proud boaster. I was going to the church, the, the, the Bap, first Baptist church to the Pentecostal power time six for 20 years. I'm a proud member here. Okay, okay, I hear that. Now what, what have you accomplished in life? Because life is all, the, the true natural flow of life if there were no impediments, is consistency in achieving and advancing and elevating. If this is not true, then the day you're born, you should have never grown to adulthood. You should never... Have you ever seen a human being achieve age six and stay at age six or seven or 10 or 50 or 80? No, because life's natural process is to advance. Deliverance comes as a result of disobedience. Because we weren't obeying the Lord, the law, now we have been put in bondage. So we need deliverance now to set us free. And how do we do it? By following the laws of God. Following the rules of God. So you don't stay. So what I'm saying to you, Kevin, you just said just now, that should not make so much sense. No one stays at six. No one stays at two. No one stays at 50 or 60. If anything, you whether whether you are progressing or not in life, your age is constant. You're still moving until the day you die. I'm saying that to say this. Let me show you how mesmerized you are. You've been a member of this church for 15 years, 10 years, 20 years. You've been given offering, tithe, seed, Merry Christmas tree. Merry Christmas tree, seed, Paul the Apostle seed, your first fruit every January, you give your entire paycheck. So if you were to count all of the money and the seed and the time you gave, you must have give over a million dollars. But here's what I want to get at. Because I said to you, I prefixed this by saying, life without any impediments is all about elevation. For the 20 years you've been to that church, what was your progress? What could you point us at and show us that for 20 years, because I know in 20 years, let's say they, a person had a baby 20 years ago, that child is an adult now. The child could walk and talk. The child could think on its own. The child probably got a job now in college, getting an education. So what am I saying? Progress, 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 progress. You bought a car 20 years ago. What did it take you? It took you from point A to point B. It, it took you. You didn't get wet up in the rain. You were, all this the car done for you. For 20 years, it was doing what it's supposed to do. For, for, for five, six years or two years, you had a pair of shoes. What did it do? It did its job. It protected your foot from the ground, from the elements. Everything that you acquired served its purpose. Except you've been to this place called church for 20 years. And the only thing you could tell us, child, one thing with me. I don't miss church. Now, I can tell you this now. I, I told my children, I don't care what. Sunday, I will find myself in the house of God. I ain't going to obey his rules now. Let me be clear there. I ain't going to obey his rules. I am going to do the Baptist dance. I am going to put my finger up when I need to go to the bathroom. I'm going to follow all of their traditions except what God say. Thank you for telling us that because you've just shown us the... Uh, formula as to why you never achieve in the 20 years that you've been there. 20 years, you're just still a member. Now, the day when you die, they got a lie and pin on your casket and in the obituary, you all of a sudden became minister and deacon or deaconess Mary. They didn't give it to you while you were living. So to make it look good to everybody, she we're going to give her that. It's almost like an honorarium. You didn't come to this college, but because of the work you did here, we can give you an honorary degree. No, boy. No, I'm trying to get you all to wake up, get up, get up. Wake up. Wake up. Because you can't get mad when people who follow the rules exceeding and excelling in life and you won't get mad at them. 
No, they're doing the right thing. They, Unlike you, they're not worshiping humans. They're following the laws of God. No, so you have a right to judge a false prophet. The scripture gives you the provision to do that. Call them out. You are a fake. Now go and spend some time with Jesus. Repent first. Repent first. Repent. Let's that's, that's, do that first. Apologize now. And now go get saved. Talking mess. And have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove, correct, or expose them. That is what the scripture is very, very clear in regards. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9. I love this one. I'm giving you laws tonight. I'm giving you rules tonight. You want deliverance? Follow the rules. Proverbs 28, verse 9. I love this. Proverbs 28 and verse 9. Proverbs 28 and verse 9. For those of you... Uh, tomorrow, let me squeeze this in here while I can remember it. Tomorrow, my teaching, I, I didn't want to mention this last week. Tomorrow, my teaching on my uh, radio program tomorrow is titled Witchcraft and Relationships. Oh, yeah. Witchcraft and Relationship. It was a teaching I was supposed to do a long time ago, but this week in particular, I've been getting the, the few counseling sessions that I had, ironically, and I don't think it's a coincidence, but ironically, they all had to do with relationships and witchcraft. So I, I've, I've determined, even from last week actually, that I'm going to do a teaching on that because clearly people need more insight. So tomorrow, you don't want to miss it. Tomorrow from 12 noon Bahamas time to 2 p.m., two hours, I'm going to be doing an extensive biblical teaching as always on witchcraft and relationship. I'm going to tell you about the signs that you can look for if your party is under spell, your other significant other, your husband, wife, whatever, and so on and so forth. So tomorrow, witchcraft and relationships, okay? So Proverbs 28, verse 9, what does it say? He that turned his he that turned away his ear from hearing the law. Everyone who's complaining about what I'm saying right now, everyone who's turning a thumbs down, because I'm not saying anything of myself. This is the laws of God. You are turning your ear. You say, I listen to this man. I check him for him because he's always bashing our pastor. So because he's bashing our God, which is our pastor, we're not going to hear him. You are not harming me, but let me tell you, let me show you what you're activating. The Bible says he, he that turned away his ear from hearing the law. I want to hear that. I'm sold into my pastor life, but I never said no so in his life. I tell you what it's so fine. I don't care what you say. I'm giving it to no poor. They need to go work. They can take your, your money and buy dope with it. The Bible never gave any sub clauses. I never read. Do not give to the poor if you think they're going to buy grass with your money. Do not give to the poor if you see them going to buy liquor. I told you before, a fella, uh, I was downtown this couple of months back, probably a year ago, and he walked to me, elderly fella, he put, put in his late 70s, 60s, very humble. He said, sir, you, you, could you spare a few dollars for me, please? Now, he never told me what he wanted it for, but all the goodness I had, I gave it to him. So when I went to this particular store and came back out, I saw this guy with a a Heineken. It was sunny that day too. And I mean the sweat just coming off of that bottle, cold beer. And I watched this guy put it in his mouth and just take a cold one. Now, I wasn't offended. You know why? I, I did my part. I, I gave. I Whatever he chose to have done with that, that's on him. Now, when the day of judgment come. And God says, Kevin, I put in you to help the poor, and I see where you did it. Now, God come to him. He says, now, I've given you chance after chance. When you need it, I put people in place like a Kevin to supply for you. But you took what I've made provisions for, and you went by booze with it. So that on him, that ain't on me. And that's why I tell you, when you give, you're not looking to see, I ain't going to give it to him because he only going to buy cocaine. He only going to buy dope with it. Buddy, if God put in your to give, it is not your business what they do with it, all right? You just had to throw that in there. So Proverbs 28 verse 9 says, He that turned away his, he that turned away his ear from hearing the law. The Bible says, even his prayer, even his prayer. I am not going to listen to Kevin. I'm going to give my pastors and my apostles all of my money. I'm going to give money to my church. I'm not giving my money to these poor people because they all they can do. They first of all, they need to go work and get a job. He likes it, right? Your pastor ain't got no job, why you give it to him? <laughs> they, they're in the same boat. But anyway, that's a different story. So I'm saying to you, God says, now when you break my laws, when you turn your ear away from listening to my laws, he says, whenever you get on your knees or however you pray, excuse me, he says, the worst prayer you could ever make 
is to make a prayer to me after rejecting my law. Because it isn't a matter of me not hearing your prayer, which I won't, but you've created a greater evil. He says, because you've rejected my law, even your prayer becomes something detestable. Now let's look at that word abomination. He said, your prayer shall become an abomination. Let's look at other uh, places in the Bible where that word is used. The Bible says, homosexuality is an abomination to the Lord. Lying is an abomination to the Lord. You would see all of these. So what it's saying, yes, sin is sin. But as it relates to the quality of sin, which is greater than the other, this is where the abomination comes in. He never said stealing was an abomination, but it's still a sin and it's still wrong. But when he says it's an abomination, he said, this, not only is this a sin, but this is detestable to me. So watch this. He's saying, when you reject my law, he's in heaven forming. This is detestable. I cannot believe that Kevin... Would, would, would give to the rich and oppress the poor and not give to the poor like I've commanded. That was my law. That was my rule. And Kevin is turning his face because he's so committed to his church people. And now he's even just making it worse by getting on his knees to pray to me. And I told him in my law that when you reject my law, even your prayer will be an abomination to me. Scripture, scripture, scripture. Script, all I've given you is scripture tonight. None is my opinion. I got no horse in the race. Scripture. Scripture. Let me see what you can type. What foolishness you can write me now? Come on, I can hear it now. Oh, forget everything when I just say, oh, you're wearing a chain. You know, you're not supposed to wear chains. Oh, this no, 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 no. Let's so let's go back to the scripture. Scripture. He says, Your prayer is an abomination. It's detestable. It is stink and filthy. It is, it is, it is stench with filth. That's your prayer. And I can hear you now, O Heavenly Father, the great Jehovah, Elohim, El Shaddai, the creator of all heaven and earth and all galaxies, Pluto, Mercury, Mars, Uranus, Venus, and earth. The great one. And God saying, if this fool only know what he or she is doing right now, you reject my law. And now you come in to pray to me when my law says, if you return your air from my law, even your prayer, even your prayer shall be an abomination. That's scripture. That's what I read here, scripture. Let's look at verse 18 of the same chapter, Proverbs 28. Verse 18 says, Whoso walketh uprightly shall be saved or rescued, but he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. So you see here, again, walking uprightly again means it talks about righteousness, walking according to the laws of God. When you do that, he says, you shall be rescued. But rescued from what? Rescued from pending dangers. Rescued from secret traps that the enemy has for you. So God, again, let me see if I get this straight because you're constantly reiterating this. You're saying to me, the only thing, you, you tell me, I don't have to go to a deliverance service. Not a, you don't have to. You're telling me I have to go through all of those hurdles? No. If you continue to follow in my laws and my rules and my regulations, I'm telling you, deliverance will be the inevitable. Let's look at uh, Proverbs 29, sorry, 29, 29, and let's look at verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18. What does it say? Proverbs 29, verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, or where is there is no plan, it says the people perish, right? But listen to this piece here. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I told you about this experience, was it? Tuesday or Wednesday, I told you there were times, and I'm sure many of you experienced this before, you woke up and you're doing your regular stuff, get ready for work or whatever, and you just feel so happy. There is absolutely nothing as evidence to verify this happiness that you have. But you just feel good. You just feel good about it. You had a good prayer. You ever, you ever did that? You just went into prayer. And after you prayed, you had this good feeling. You just felt so good. You just talked to your Jesus. Or you had an opportunity to, to, to do something wrong and you determined, no, I can do the right thing. Even though it's costing you a lot of money to do the right thing. But somebody was giving you a shortcut and you say, no, man, I'm not going to do that. But the reason why you're doing this is because you're like, I don't want to break the laws of God. I just want to do this. I also do the right thing. And you feel good. Well, listen to what the scripture says. 
But he that keepeth the law, he that keepeth the rules, he that follow the commandments, he that do the ordinance and the commands of God, happy shall this person be. Scripture. I hear he that spin around, give your neighbor a high five, lick your neighbor nice, say, neighbor, neighbor, I love you, neighbor, I love you, neighbor. Now, you know you don't talk to this person, <laughs> okay? So stop your lies. So the scriptures, are, all of these are rules I'm showing you. All of these are laws. All of these are ordinances that the Bible is constantly revealing to us. Now, let's look at this, let's look at this scripture here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 13, right? Is it first? No. 14 and 33. 14 and 33, right. First Corinthians 14, verse 33. Listen to what it says. For God is not the author of confusion. You gave a prophecy. It didn't come to pass. And now you're trying to say God changed his mind. That's confusion. So why should I believe you? When the scripture is telling me, God says, Kevin, how much more, Kevin, if y'all would only listen to me just once, just once. I know that's your favorite teacher, you know, I know that's your favorite pastor. But Kevin, you cannot put them over my word. I am not a God of confusion. If they said that today will be black and today was just pure light, Kevin, that is confusion. And the evidence and, and, and the evidence of that, of, of what it's saying here in terms of the confusion is that I am not a part of that. So if anyone come back with an amended prophecy, or oh, God didn't do it because this and that and blah, blah, blah. No, no, that's confusion. That is confusion. The Bible is clear. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33. It says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So you can't tell me, you, 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 okay, you're telling me, let's, let's use another example, see it's away, or covering or whatever garbage y'all got going on the outside of the, the rules of God. And this is putting more pressure and turmoil and division and confusion in the church. Because people now saying, this is all I got, you ask me for another seed. That's confusion, that is not of God, but watch how God do it. Second Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6, I think it is. He says, let every man give according to what? His heart. No pressure. No twisting of the rich. Risk, sorry. No gimmicks. No sales pitches. No marketing. Nothing here. As a preacher, all I'm concerned about is giving you the word of God. That's it. I want to give you the word of God. I'm giving you the word of God. Now, whether you sow or not, that on you. But you won't get me asking you nothing because my concern is doing the will of the Father. Because again, we're in a partnership. So God got to ensure that I'm sustained to do his will. I don't have to beg and hustle and play games and give different names to seed and tell you write your name on it so that this money seed you're putting in here for $400 could produce a car. And you put another $7 million in this and give you a house. When the Bible says every seed produce after its kind. So I can't see how the money can produce a fruit that money don't produce. So you're trying, you're indoctrinating me to go against the obvious laws of God and, 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 and submit myself to your rules and your church policy. It will never happen in this lifetime. Never. Never. When I was stupid and ignorant and donkey to hear, oh yeah, you had me then because see, I was looking, looking for teaching and looking for wisdom. And, and I'm glad I fall into some of them who was talking nonsense because now I can could, you know, tell the difference between what is truth and what is not now. And I always tell you, in order to understand or even recognize good, you must have at some point experienced evil. That's the only way you know that there is good. You must have encountered evil. So I'm not knocking them. I thank God for them, but they can't pull out of me no more. No. So wherever there is confusion, God says, that is not of me. So that's a sign for you. If this is bringing up these false prophecies and false whatever garbage, he says, when you see confusion, let us be clear. This is not of me. This is not of me. All right? Now, I want to wrap up here with two particular uh, scriptures. Two. And the first one I want us to look at is Joshua. I want you to write this down. Joshua chapter 1, 
sorry, Joshua chapter 3, Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. And I'm just giving you the scriptures in advance in the event that we don't get to finish them, all right? So I'm trying to summarize this. Joshua chapter 3, and what I'm doing with these, these scriptures here, everything that I've spoken about since Tuesday to now, I'm bringing it all together in these two particular scriptures so it can all make sense. And I'm going to put all the components in place so it will make perfect sense to you. The importance of following the laws of God to achieve the deliverance that you seek or to always be in the right timing of your set time of deliverance. It's only going to come through following the scriptures and partnering with God so that you can encoder your set time. All right? Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Okay, then we're going to read Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4, verses 10 to 18. Okay? I'm going to repeat it again. Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 to verse 17. And we're going to focus on verse 7. We can get there. Then Joshua chapter 4, verses 10 to verse 18. Then the final scripture, the final scripture, because these are two, two are in Joshua, but it's actually two separate ones. So 2 Chronicles 20, 2 Chronicles 20, from verse 1 to verse 25. And again, I'm going to condense it in the teaching. I'm not going to read all through it. I just want to hit on the main points because I'm trying to show you the components to bring about your set time of deliverance or not even bring it about, but to be in the right standing. Now, you might say, you might preempt all this by saying, well, Kevin, what about us who already missed our set times? I think I alluded to that somewhat uh, in the first teaching, and that is that uh, there's a, there are two scriptures, actually, that I can refer to. Well, a couple of them, to be honest with you, that promise you promises you that even when you miss your set time, then that set, that, set, that, that whatever it was supposed to be can be recouped or or restored. I can, let me think of a couple right now. Number one, uh, Proverbs, and you could write these down, and these for, for those who would have missed their set times. These are the prayers. You could include these scriptures in your prayer for restoration. The first one is Joel 2 and 25, where God promises that he, he says, I will restore unto you. These are his believers now. I will restore. So the mere fact that he's using the word restore, it means that you would have lost something or something was damaged. So to restore means to either replace it or to repair it, or to fix it, or to make it new again. Joel 2 and 25, I'll restore unto you the years that the canker worm, the caterpillar, the locust, and the palmer worm has eaten away or whatever. So these insects are just symbolic, again, like I've been telling you, of evil spirits that was eating away at your set times and blessings and so on. Of course, you would have allowed it through whether you was bamboozled by someone or someone with witchcraft or you was involved in so or whatever sins or laws or you were breaking, that gave the enemy the right to come in. All right? So that's one. Number two, if you look at Proverbs 11, verse 31a, and what does it say? It says, the righteous, that's you and I who are believers, shall be recompensed in the earth. The word recompense means to be reimbursed for losses or injuries that you would have suffered. So this is another scripture as it relates to those who would have passed their set time. There was a time set for you to be delivered. There was a time set for your breakthrough. There was a time set to break this poverty cycle. But for some reason, for whatever reason, you, 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 you something maintain your existence in a season that you should have already left. So now what's happening is the deliverance for that time, that's passed you by. So in Proverbs 11, verse 31a, it says, The righteous, this is a promise, but this is only for the righteous, though. The righteous shall be recompensed. So God is saying to you, believer, you who've lost this, you whose husband left you, you whose wife done this, you who this, whatever, he says, I am going to recompense you. I am going to repay you. Okay? So that's Old Testament. When we shoot over to the New Testament, which the laws and the promises are even greater, in in Hebrews 10 verse 35, I think it is, Hebrews 10 verse 35, it says that we must not cast away our confidence or our belief in God or his word. 
for it shall work for us, watch the prefix here because this is important, it shall work for us a great recompense of reward. Now, this is powerful. Why? Because when we go back to the Old Testament original promise about God recompensing us or reimbursing us for what we've lost over our lifetime, he says, the righteous shall be. So he's guaranteeing you that you would at minimum get equal to what you lost. This is Old Testament. The New Testament is saying to you in Hebrews 10 verse 35, he says, do not lose hope. Do not uh, uh, lose confidence in my word. Because in keeping my word, in spite of what you see, this is generating for you. This will manifest for you a great recompense of reward. So the, the prefix great before the word recompense mean that what you're getting in return will exceed your original losses. Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? That's why you need understanding of the word. So that's a moment ready to get excited. He says, you will, if you, if you keep into my word, if you follow my rules, if you have confidence in it, he says, you are now, you are now on the path for not just recompense, but great recompense. You, I will like, what I'm going to do for you, I'm going to exceed the original losses that you had. Let's put some more scripture on this. Ephesians 3 and 20. Ephesians 3 and 20, and only backing up this great recompense. He said, I will do for you, watch what I'm going to do for you now, and all of this is because you're following my laws, my rules, my commandments. And now what I want you guys to see here, you're not seeing any pre- Requisites such as seed sowing, such as spin around, such as blowing a shofar, such as putting a scarf on you, such as drinking Jesus juice and Jesus M&M and Jesus lollipop. None of that. He said in Ephesians 3 and 20, he says, I will do for you, you who are following my rules, who you are following my laws and my commandments. You're not mixing them up. He says, I will do exceedingly abundantly and above all that you could ever ask or think according to the power or that there means the word of God that you're operating in your life. So let me break this down for you. He says, I will do exceedingly. Exceedingly means to go beyond a certain mark. There was this cross in the road here, this line in the sand that I couldn't get past. So God says, now if you follow my rules, and you adhere to the terms, we are in agreement. You abide, I abide in you and you in me. As a result of this, now you're going to produce more fruit than you were ever producing before. But as you can see, this will not happen without me. So Ephesians 3 and 20 amplifies this even more. He says, now listen, I'm not doing exceedingly and abundantly and above all that you could ever ask or think because I want to do this. No, no. Because you are following my laws, because you, I abide in you and you and me, we are one. And because you are following the rules, you cost this on yourself, Kevin. You got me doing more than I, you got me doing even more for you than you expected. I will do exceedingly, I will do abundantly and above all that you could ever ask or think. Why? Are you doing this because you're giving me more money than Mary over here? No. Are you doing this because you come to church every Sunday? No. Uh, 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 is God doing this for you because you have the key to the church door? No. Why is God doing this? He is doing it because the one he's doing it for, they are following his rules, his regulations, his laws, his principles, and he is letting no human override the laws of God. He don't care who they are because his greatest respect it's for the eternal Elohim, El Shaddai, Jehovah Mechadesh, Jehovah my banner. That's where his confidence is. That's where his belief and commitment is to. He don't see his leader as a savior. He don't see his leader. He sees his leader as the one who's supposed to be pointing me to the one who can do exceedingly. The one who could restore me for the losses. The one who could make up in my life the losses that I've had. No human could do that for me. No, no covering they have could do that for me. The only covering is Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the head of all things. Everything exists and consists because of him. Not a human. Get it right. The only thing this is. Numero uno, Jesus Christ. Did you try that? So get out of here, man. You cannot fool me anymore. You can't put loss. You can't threaten me and try to put fear in me. Touch not God's anointed. As soon as, the minute you show me God's anointed, then I might listen to you. Because I know you ain't it. False prophet. Oh, why don't you try that? We need to know the scriptures. 
not personalities. What is the fruit you are producing other than your fancy talk and fake uh, signs, wonders, and miracles? No, we don't want to hear that, man. Get out of here. So let's go to Joshua. In these two scriptures, what I'm going to quickly go through, I'm now going to, like I say, bring all of the pieces together, all right? From Tuesday all the way to now. And what I'm showing you here is what I've been reiterating. If you follow God's rules, success is the, even if you don't want success, you can't control it no more because you don't participate in the rules to achieve success. It's very simple. All right? In Joshua chapter 3, this have to do now with crossing the Jordan River. And God had given them specific instructions, especially to Joshua, which he would have now passed on to the priests and so on. And if they would follow these rules, it simply means that they're abiding in him and he's abiding in them and them in him. And this is a joint effort to bring about deliverance. So deliverance for them in this case is crossing the Jordan River, which is a very deep river. But if they follow the rules of God, God is going to do for them what they couldn't do for themselves. He's going to actually part the river and let everybody walk through dry land until they get on the next side, and then the river will supernaturally close like it's supernaturally open. But none of this could be achieved if they do not follow the laws of God. All right? So Joshua chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, and it says, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. Verse 2 of Joshua 3. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your places and go after it. So these are the rules that they're supposed to follow. Of course, these rules would have come from God. Verse 4, yet there shall be a space between you, specific instructions, specific instructions, there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come now near unto it, that you may know the way by which you, by the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way uh, here to or, or before. Verse 5 of Joshua 3. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourself, uh huh, for tomorrow the Lord will be will do wonders among you. And Joshua spoke unto the priests, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant. And pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. So let's put a finger right in here because I got to explain something before we go to verse 7. As you would know, Joshua was the one that replaced Moses, right? God said to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, verse 3, I think it is. He said, for my servant Moses is dead. Meaning that from this point forward, you're going to build on what Moses left in place. You're not to be Moses. Now, the difficulty with this is, is because Moses was such a great leader and revered by the children of Israel, as with any transition in leadership or replacement in leadership, people will always compare the former good leader with the, in, the coming, the incoming leader. So no matter how much good ideas the new leader may have, people are so set in their ways that they're now going to look through the lens of this leader based on what the former leader did. And I'm sure you guys understand what I'm saying because I'm sure you've had that experience before. So it makes it very difficult for the new leader to push his agenda or do, in this case, what God has called him to do. Because every minute they're saying, now, hold on now, Moses didn't do it like that. So what does brother think he doing? You think this is? To try that. You ain't Moses. We respect him. We don't know you. Now remember, Joshua was under the tutelage of Moses. In fact, Moses called him his minister. So Joshua was the one there. And the thing about it, God brought Joshua before the people to tell them, this is going to be your new leader when I'm off the scene. But they wasn't hearing that then because they're like, no, 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 no. We like you. We don't used to you. We are accustomed to you. So God said to Joshua, in the beginning of his uh, reign over Israel, he says, let me be clear. Moses, my servant, is dead. Meaning that while you partner your life after Moses from a biblical law and rule perspective, 
you don't turn it into Moses. We see that a lot. I have a lot of colleagues like that. They we grow up on the certain pastors, and because they were so, uh, I wouldn't want to use the word bullied, but they're so indoctrinated in the covering, even when they speak and behave, you see their pastor in them. So they, they, the pastors indoctrinate them to become them. This is what God was trying to avoid happening to Joshua. I don't want you to become like Moses. That's why I said my servant Moses is dead. So you, you, the reason why I pick you, because unlike Moses, you are a warrior. You, you taking the baton from him, but not to become like him. And I tell you, a lot of, a lot of ministers and, and lay ministers, they, they, they extract and, and mimic their leaders like it's a, I don't know. But they cannot be themselves. So God is making this clear to him. So as you can see here now, Joshua have a major problem. Leading over 3 million people, that's number one. But now you got to develop a relationship with these people that is almost impossible because they are so heavily addicted to Moses. This is powerful. So now let's listen to verse 7 of Joshua 3. And the Lord said unto Joshua, boy, I love this, yeah? And the Lord said unto Joshua, this day, because God understood what was happening here. God knew that they don't really respect you. They, they, they follow in you because they know what the consequences are based on the laws. But I see what happening. Don't think I see Joshua. So he says in verse 7 of Joshua 3, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee. I want you to circle that word because I'm going to complete this particular verse, but I'm going to come back to that word. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know uh -huh, that I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. What I'm about to do with you, Joshua, well, not really you, but them, what I'm about to do with them, because they were convinced that I was with Moses. They they had all the evidence there, the the the, the parting of the Red Sea, the taking them out of Egypt, the miracles, the plagues. They they know. They they listen. If there's one thing they know, they know that I was with them. You haven't done anything yet to convince them that I am with you, other than. Moses handing thing that you were going to be the leader. But there's nothing. You haven't part no Red Sea. You haven't done. In fact, you're preparing to part the Jordan River. And that has not happened yet. So God says, he, listen to what he says here. He says, this day will I begin to magnify you. Hold on. What do you mean you're going to magnify me? Well, to understand this, we need to get the definition of the word magnify. God says, the, the word magnify says, means to, to, to make something bigger or make it, sorry, make something appear to be bigger than what it is. To embellish means to decorate it in such a way to make it look more grand than what it is. But I want you to listen to the wording of the scripture. Because reading it, you're thinking that God is doing something to Joshua. God is doing absolutely nothing to Joshua when you read the scripture. He is doing something to the children of Israel. Listen what it says. And that's why reading and understanding is key for revelation. God says, and the Lord said to Joshua, what did he say to Joshua? This day will I begin to magnify thee. Now that sounds like, Kevin, you, you can't read it. God is doing something to Joshua. No, 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 no. Continue to read. This day I will magnify thee. How am I going to magnify you? In the sight of all Israel. Let me explain that. Okay, Joshua, sorry, Moses, clearly God was with him, like I said, because of the miracles. So what did God promise initially before magnifying him? He said, Sorry, afterwards he says, I'm going to magnify you. And the reason why I'm going to do this is because they were convinced I was with Moses because of the miracles. You haven't done any. So therefore, what I'm going to do in their sight towards you is going to give you the same respect, the same honor as if you did what Moses did. So how are you going to do this, God? I'm going to magnify you. Nothing to do with you. I ain't doing nothing to do before them. So if to magnify means to make something, listen to the key word, appear to be bigger than what it is, 
God, I mean, nothing is changing with Joshua. However, let's look at the children of Israel. He's magnifying Joshua in whose sight? In their sight. So when they look at Joshua, all of a sudden after God did the spiritual magnification, wow, they have this awe, this reverence for this man. My God, we got to obey him. Lord, the same anointing that was on Moses, on this man. But he hasn't done anything. He hasn't pardoned a Red Sea. He has indeed done absolutely nothing. But what? See, I got to put this in here right now. Some of you listening to me right now, you on a job, you're educated, you got everything, to, you should have been ahead. But listen, they looking at you as nobody. Pray, God, magnify me like you've magnified Joshua in the sight of the Israelite. Magnify me in the sight of my co-workers. Magnify me in the sight of my family members. Magnify me in the sight of my friends who look at me as the outcast, who have labeled me as the black sheep. You need magnification from God. Who are you talking to today? Who am I talking to today? He did nothing to Joshua. Instead, when he might, he said, he said, Joshua, I'm going to magnify you in the sight. He did nothing to Joshua, but he did everything to them. I'm going to magnify you in the sight of Israel. So all of a sudden, you ain't do no miracles, no sign, no wonder, but you're the leader now. And Moses got some big shoes to fill. So I'm telling you, when I magnify you, they will now know that as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. Boy, look here, if that ain't something to jump in. See, now these are the reasons why you should be somersaulting in church, okay? <laughs> Not when it's seed time, when you hear the unadulterated word of God. Say, God, magnify me in the sight of my husband. Magnify me in the sight of my wife. Magnify me in the sight of my children. You all hearing this? Are you all reading this? So what God is going to do, nothing with you, but he's going to change their spiritual lens to see you different. All of a sudden, they're respecting you now. All of a sudden, they're behaving different with you now. Why? Was it something you did? It was because you give a seed. It was because you give a what? Magnify seed? Because you can't wait for a new word to hear in the Bible to put a seed there. No. What you did is you follow this Lord, magnify me. So long story short, you could read the rest of it. When they followed the rules, they were able to cross. The, 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 when they followed what God told them to do, the river was parted. And they were able to go across. Now, now let's go quickly to Joshua chapter 4. Now let's go to the next chapter. And we're going to read from verse uh, 10. Excuse me, we can pick it up from verse 10. Joshua 4 verse 10. Verse 10 to verse 18. It says, For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished, and the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua, and the people hastened and passed over. And it came to pass, when all the people were cleaned, passed over, cleaned, passed over, the ark of the Lord passed over, and the priests in the presence of the people and the children of Reuben and the children of God and half the tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses spoke unto them. About 40,000 prepared for war passed over before the Lord unto battle to the plain of Jericho. Okay, to the plain, to the plain of Jericho. Listen to verse 14. Listen to verse 14 again. On that day, the Lord magnified. Oh man, listen, this is so awesome. Y'all listen to this. Are uh, y'all listening to this? God did absolutely nothing to Joshua. However, because the word magnify means to make something appear. If you have the, these lens that I'm wearing right now, the purpose of these, because if I were to take them off, things look a little fuzzy and confusing to me, and I can't see that well. When I put them on, the letters that I'm looking at never change. The letters that I'm looking up, the sentences, the paragraphs never change. But because these lens magnified the writing that I'm looking at, it made the writing appear to be bigger than it really is. Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? You roll right up on this live and get in your peace right now. This is what the Lord's saying to you. God says, I'm going to magnify you 
in the presence of your enemies. I'm going to magnify you. They got you as the black sheep. You at the back of the line. Those days are over. Your set time has come. I'm about to magnify you in the midst of your family. I'm about to magnify you in your place of worship. I'm about to magnify you on your job. All you have to do is follow, just like Joshua, follow my instructions. And as I was with your grandma, you were saved. As I was with your daddy, you was a preacher. As I was with your cousin, so shall I be with you. But the only tweaking we need to do here to set everything straight, I'm going to magnify you amongst those who despise you. Try that. And it ain't going to cost you a penny, not a dollar. So if they come with magnify and see it, throw them some pumpkin seed. it. Say, too no good. God said in verse 14 of Joshua 4, On that day the Lord magnified Joshua. How? In the sight of Israel. So he changed the spiritual lens of Israel. So now when we look at our brother Joshua, this guy looked like a decorated soldier captain. This guy looked like a man of decorum and esteem. Why? Because Jehovah Elohim magnified him. What did he do? He made him appear bigger than what he really was. Oh, Lord. This is how God compensated. Okay, just like some of you right now, there's a promotion that you want, but everybody around you got all the degrees, the master, the this, the that. All you got is your, your, your high school, but you know the job. And you're saying, Lord, I don't stand a chance. Here. Yes, a liar. Yes, a liar. Because as he was with Joshua, so shall he be with you. And what is he going to do? He is going to magnify you in the sight of the interviewer. So that even though those who came before and after you with all the qualifications won't get the job, you are going to get it. Why? Because God magnified you. Try that. Don't you try that. Get it together. Get it together. God, listen to me. When you're dealing with, see, that's why I tell you, God ain't no joke like these jokers trying to make him to be. You don't put money in him. There's a whole heap of laws and rules and protocols that you follow like we're reading right now. You never knew the scripture. Never knew this. I've ministered the scriptures many places I went to because I live this. I live it. They said to me, you, 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 there's a promotion coming up and we need a minimum of five years of sales with a, a minimum of a bachelor's degree. I had none of them. None. But what did God do? Because I know it's my set time. Oh, I love to tell the story. What did God do for you, Kevin? Well, tell, tell him, tell him, tell him your testimony. God magnified me in the midst of my interviewers. To the extent they interviewed nobody else. Because this man here got what we're looking for. But he didn't have the five years. He didn't have the bachelor's. Okay, and what else? Because he don't need that once God would have magnified him. Oh, Lord, who am I talking to today? Who am I talking to today? We're talking to today. God will magnify you in the midst of your oppressors. God will magnify you in the midst of your detractors. God will magnify you in the midst of your family members who are always talking about you. God will magnify you amongst your court. You, all you have to do is follow his rules, his regulations. I told you when they announced that they was they were doing an opening for the job opening, I said, I knew, I knew this was me. I, cause I knew what I was doing. I knew the fasting. I knew the praying. I knew this. So I put in my time. I did my part. And all I was doing was waiting on God to do his. So when I went into that interview, yes, I was nervous, but that nervousness had nothing to do with my confidence that this is my set time. And God is about to magnify me in the presence of my interviewers. The word came back. They say, man, you mashed that interview right up. That's what my former boss told me. He said, yeah, the word is you, you, you tear it up. You think you got it. And I walk off, I think I get it. You mean I have it? Eh? <laughs> Why? Because God magnified me in the midst of my oppressors. He magnified me with the interviewers. He magnified me. Now, this is when you start singing, when you're singing the word of God. God is, listen to me carefully. I don't know who you are. God is going to make, if you follow the rules, I, the, the prophecy here, if you follow the rules, what I tell you, the laws and the rules and the principles of God are like prophecies. They tell you the end from the beginning. So if you're doing what I did and Joshua did and everybody else did, God said, I will magnify you. I will make you appear bigger than you are. Mm -hmm. I will make you 
When I got the job, I mastered that job. I left, I retired from my job with honors. Walk away from it. I will magnify you, Kevin. I will mag- I'm will talking to someone. The Lord is going to magnify you. I don't care what they tell you. And I don't care what qualifications they say you don't have. God is going to magnify you. Now, let me tell you, this is the prophecy right here. When you get the job, you will get it. And the qualifications that you didn't have, they're going to put you through school to get the qualifications at their expense. You will, you will write me and tell me about it. So going back to the story now, again, you could read the rest of the story. All the story is going to reveal in... In Joshua chapter, in Joshua chapter three, in Joshua chapter four, and when you go all the way down to the Jericho wall, what is the consistency in all of these stories? Well, the consistency, other than God magnifying him and they seeing him totally different than what they used to see him as, the consistency is here. There was always a partnership between the children of Israel and God, and the partnership was based on the terms of agreement, which was the rules and the laws and the regulations of God. What you're going to see is specific things. And the priest got up and circled X amount of time with the people. And the priest went ahead and the children of Israel came X amount of feet behind. You're going to see these specific instructions. What these instructions are is when they follow it, they're coming in agreement or covenant with the terms and agreement that God put in place. Not what Joshua put there, not what Moses put there, not what the captains of the army put there. No, 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 no. That's man's rules and ordinance and church policies, which will guarantee you failure in the end. What they were doing was specifically what God said. And every time they did what God said, they got the God kind of results. And they were getting multiple victories. Why? Because the terms of agreement said, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, whatsoever you shall ask shall be done unto you. If you abide in me and my word abide in you, if I abide in you, which is his word, he says you shall produce more fruit. And verse 8 of John 15, of John 15, it says, and this is my father. Jesus says, my father is glorified. He is uplifted. He is honored to see you producing more fruit because it is a clear evidence that it is as a result of following his word. People, I'm trying to tell you, there are no shortcuts to the victory in Christ. There are no shortcuts to get the kind of result. There is no sub-clause. There's nothing which you will say. If Okay, one scripture says, if you abide in me and I in you, this will happen. You will never find another scripture says, you don't have to abide. But if you drink this juice, then the same thing that if you had abide will happen. You will never see that. So get the nonsense of taking shortcuts out of your head. And follow the word. What is the shortcuts? Miracle juice, miracle M&M, miracle crunch, crunch, crunchy bar, miracle Chinese food, uh, miracle juice water, Jesus, uh, hanky, garbage. If you want deliverance, follow the rules, follow the laws, follow the principles of God. He says, I will honor those that honor me. How are we honoring God when we follow his rules? There is no shortcut. There is no shortcut in the kingdom. The kingdom is in some back door alley. You have to follow the rules. Follow the rules. All of this Jesus juice is nonsense. Stop it. All of the fake miracles and deliverance on TV with people uh, jump kicking you to the floor and you on the ground spitting out stuff. All of this stuff here, 98% of it is, is nonsense. It's a movie. They're actors and actresses that have nothing to do with God. And the evidence of it is that none of it points to God, but it points to the one who claimed to be the deliverer. And that right there is the only evidence you need that that place is a place of devils. I told you the second sign is they will rape you for every dime you have. You know, they don't put on no show for free up in there. You can pay for that. So our last chapter here, our last scripture here, 2 Chronicles 20. Second Chronicles 20. This is powerful. This is very, very powerful. Second Chronicles 20. I want us to turn there because you can see some powerful stuff. And again, the, the, the trend here is people who partnership with God, when trouble come or not, they, they, they understand that as a mere mortal, there's very little I could achieve in terms of victory. But if I partner with the 
Spirit of God, who have said to me that I am heirs with him, God, and joint heirs with his son, Jesus Christ. So that in and of itself said this is a partnership, but the rules or the terms of agreement is, it, is the Holy Scriptures. Kevin, if you follow this, if you walk uprightly, what do the scripture says? You shall be delivered. So far, do you mean effortlessly? Just if I walk uprightly? Meaning, if I do your laws? Kevin, I don't know why you're trying to make it so difficult. If you follow my laws, my rules, my principles, very simple, Kevin. Deliverance is automatic. You can be delivered from stuff you don't even know you're bound to. It's automatic. No game playing. No spin around. No high five your neighbor. No run from one end of the church and run your head into the pulpit and they got to call the ambulance for you. That's 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 confusion. He says, Kevin, I told you I'm not a god of confusion. Follow my rules and follow my laws. So 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. I love this so much. Listen to this. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon with them other beside the Amorites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. So at this point in that time in history, Jehoshaphat, the kingdom was split. It is split as a result of what Solomon did in disobeying God. So God had divided the kingdom. So Jehoshaphat at this time is the king of Judah. And if I'm not mistaken, his counterpart, I think, was uh, Ahab, who was the king of Israel. I'm, I'm, I can be stand to be corrected. But anyway, so the scriptures are saying that several nations decided to come against Judah. And these were nations that were far greater than them. It said Moab, Ammon, and besides the Amorites, there were others. So verse 2 says, Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on the side Syria, and behold, they be in, whatever that word is, which is in Enjadi. Verse 3, and Jehoshaphat feared, which is normal. That's like 6 trillion people coming against me, one. So he says, and Jehoshaphat feared, but watch what he did, though, because he realized oh, off the bat, I can't beat these people. So I got to go look for my, for my partner now. And Jehoshaphat feared, and listen, and set himself to do what? To do who? To do what? What are you meant to do again? He went to look for the one who he is heirs and joined heirs with. He went to look for supernatural power because he have, there's an agreement. And if he's following that agreement, then they have to step in for him. But this is the good part. When they step in, they're not going to do the natural. Oh, I love this piece here. When they step in, they're going to do what they did for Joshua and them. They're going to do something supernatural, such as part the Jordan River, such as supernaturally knock down the fortified walls of Jericho. See, when God step in, once you're partnering with him, he's not only going to help you, but the help is going to be supernatural. It's not going to be normal talking to somebody, follow the scripture. You don't got to believe me. Watch the scripture. I know some of you are mad because I ain't asked you for no seed, but that don't work here. Follow the scriptures. I know you're mad because I ain't selling no Jesus juice and Jesus chocolate and Kool-Aid, but I can't afford them things. And I don't do nonsense. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord, to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout Judah. So he's following the rules to invite his partner, which is, which is God. And Judah, verse 4, gathered themselves together to listen, to listen, to do who? To ask help of the Lord. But what was the protocol? They did a fast. They went on a fast. They prayed. They seek. They didn't went to the Sangoma. They didn't go to the Obeah man. They didn't go to the witch doctor. They didn't go to the high priest of Satan camp. They didn't call in the coven or the Freemason. No. The Bible said they went on a fast to seek help from who? From who? From the Lord. To, to ask help of the Lord, even out of all of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our father, art not thou God in heaven and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? All these are questions. Verse 7 of Second Chronicles 20. Art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of the land before the people, before thy people Israel, and gavest it to thy seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? And they dwell therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us as the sword judge, 
as the sword, judgment or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house. And cry unto thee in our afflictions, then thou will hear and help. Verse 10. And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. So let's put a, 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 a pin right there. Joshua starts off by telling God how great he is and how he has delivered them out of many trials, snares, and temptations, and so on. When he would have finished with all of that salutation, he then says, now these children of Ammon and Mount Seir and them, these people whom you didn't let us take their heads off and mash them up, we spared their lives. We had mercy on them. We did good to them. But here it is now. They want to reward us with evil. And now they're coming to take us down. See, this dude was in silly. Clearly he understood a principle. Clearly he understood a law. And what was that law? Proverbs 7 verse 13, 17 verse 13. What does it say? Whosoever rewarded evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. He's, in, he's extending an invitation to evil when he is doing evil to someone who did good to him. So this is what's happening here. And I'm going to just summarize it. And I'm going to read all of it. You can read all of it in your time. The Bible says that after all of this uh, monologue with him and with him to God, right? The Bible says that God sent a prophet and he's, the prophet said to them, uh, he said that, that this battle is not yours, but the battle is the Lord. And he went on to say, I think in, in verse uh, 14 somewhere. Anyway, he said, he said, believe the Lord and be established. Believe his prophet and you shall prosper. He said, now when the day to fight come, he said, you can go down there, but you're only going to observe. This is the Lord's battle. So you see now, the Lord is saying to him, because we are joint partners, you did your part. When you fasted, when you seek me, you didn't return evil for evil to them. You didn't do none of that. What you did was put your confidence in me. And how did you put, they put their confidence in you, Jesus, God. They put their confidence in God when they followed the laws of God. When you're following the rule, you, you have the choice to do evil. You have the choice, the choice to send back evil to evil. But you said, no, the scripture doesn't say that. Even though there's an army coming against me, I'm going to stick with the Lord. I'm going to stick to his rules. I'm going to stick to his principles. Long story short, the Bible says that when the Bible says God tell him to come down into the valley. And the Bible says that Jehoshaphat throw a pre-party celebration. <laughs> this is so awesome. Where all the singers and those from, from uh, Judah, and they start to praise the Lord and give him glory. And speaking the, the victory well in advance before it happened. So listen to this now. The children of Mount Seir, Ammon, and, and whoever else, all of the other nations, they're coming on one accord to destroy Israel. They're coming, running, running to tear them apart. Israel is like a small fraction of people compared to the multitudes of vicious soldiers coming to rip them apart. The Bible is very clear. And it says that God sent an ambushment <laughs> what is an ambushment? You got to make sense of this now. The word ambushment speaks of a surprise attack. That means that if, let's say, uh, you, you, I, I came to your home and I'm, I'm hiding in the bush. And when you came out, I jump and attack you. You didn't know I was coming. It's called an, an ambushment. It's also labeled as guerrilla warfare. You don't know I was coming. You didn't know I was there waiting on you. You had no, this was a regular routine for you to pull up in your yard and lock your car and walk up to your house. But you didn't know a group of us was right there waiting on us and we ambush you. But what I said to you earlier, I said to you, when you partner with God, not only will God help you, but the help, that's how you know it's going to be from God, that's going to come to you, is going to be supernatural help. The Jericho wall was impenetrable. No human could have knocked it down, but God did when they partnered. The Jordan River could not be parted by human, but God parted it when they partnered with him. The Red Sea could not be parted by Moses, but God did it when Moses partnered with him. The, the, the sun could not stand still and wait for Joshua to finish the war, 
Joshua couldn't do that. But God made it stand still when he partnered with him. I'm showing to you that deliverance is a joint effort. There's a part that you play before God intervene and do his part. So the Bible says God sent an ambushment. So if the basis or the meaning of ambushment is a surprise attack from your opponent, but the scripture says what this ambushment cause is that when the, the, the children of Mount Seir and Ammon and the Moabites were all coming as a multitude against them, all of a sudden they begin to turn on themselves and kill each other. Who killed each other, Kevin? The alliance, which was Mount Seir, Ammon, and Moab. These three nations and other nations with them. The Bible said, as they're coming all on one accord to destroy Judah, for some reason, while they're coming, they're turning on one another and killing one another. So the Bible said this is happening because God sent an ambushment. But who was this ambushment, though? Because nobody, nowhere in the scripture are you going to read, there was three kung fu fellas dressed in black suits and swords and stuff. No, 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 no. God sent spiritual agents in there to confuse them. And they turned on one another and murdered one another. Why is this happening? Because they partnership with God. And the evidence that this partnership, based on the terms that they are following to the letter, God has to now come in and supernaturally do for them that could have never happened under normal circumstances. Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? The Bible says after they destroyed themselves, the Bible said the whole valley was filled with silver and gold and you name it. And it took Israel, I think, three days to collect of the spoil. I, oh, who am I talking to today? To collect of the spoil that, <coughs> excuse me, that was left as a result of the, the, the carnage done by when they turned on one another. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to somebody. There's a group against you. There are groups against you. But God says he's going to send an ambushment. You don't have to do nothing. You don't pray against them. You pray for them. You bless those that curse you. You pray for those that despitefully use you and say all manner of things against you. I know you were taught different. You were taught to send back evil prayers to sender. But if you do that, when the ambushment come, you got to be destroyed too. To avoid destruction, do it God way. Okay, God, that's hard to do. But cleanse my heart about this poison for so I can truly pray for them. So, Lord, even though they're sending witchcraft attacks against me, even though they're lying on me and pulling my name in the dirt, I'm going to bless them because they're cursing me. I am praying for them because I know they're despitefully using me. What am I doing? I'm coming in alignment with the terms and agreements of the scripture for God now to come in supernaturally and do for me what he did for the, for the children of Judah. God will send an ambushment. God will magnify you. All you have to do, the only rule you have to play is follow the rules. There is no place in this teaching that I did tonight that I tell you, you have to sow a seed. There's no place where I told you, you have to, to take a miracle cloth or blow a shofar. None of that is required. I'm not discounting it, you know. I'm reading here. You read it too, right? None of that was required. That is not required. Re whatever God tell you to do, whatever he said to you. And sometimes you may say, I believe God spoke to me, but I'm sure. But you know what to do, God? Whatever you spoke to me, whether it's internally, whether it's in a dream, where is my prophet? Now, Lord, confirm what you said to me in the natural. Let someone come here and say the same thing I heard over here, and that will be confirmation to me. Let me open my Bible, and I turn to the exact words I heard in my spirit. Let me turn on the TV, and I listen to a Christian program, and the man or the woman say the exact same thing, what you said to me. Then that's confirmation for me, and I'm going to run with this word. I don't care what happened. I'm going to cleave to this, because this word becomes the terms of agreed, the terms of, of, of agreement. If I adhere to your rules, we are now in partnership. And once I would have done what I'm supposed to do, you have to come into this place supernaturally and do what I couldn't do on my own. Don't talk, don't mess to me. No. Listen to the word of God. Huh? You can't go wrong. There you can go wrong. I have told you nothing against the word of God tonight. But yet you will find someone. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I got to sow this. Kevin preached it, but I got to sow this to my pastor. <laughs> <laughs> y'all, y'all do no good. I'm <laughs> serious. But hear me and hear me well. Again, let me be clear. See, sometimes you just have to be clear because people just get confused. I am not advocating you cannot sow seeds to your preachers, to your pastors. I Let me be clear. 
because like with everything else, it has to be facilitated through finances. But do it according to what God put in your heart. No force, no pressure. You may not even be led to do it. But besides all of that, don't ever let seed become the source of your faith. Faith is the word of God. That should be your source. Okay, what can happen if you don't have no seed? What if happened if you've been employed for the past five months and you have no money, nobody lending you no money? So what you what you can do that? But what is common among the rich and the poor, the smart and the not smart, the fat, the skinny, the black, white? What is common? The Holy Scriptures. Hence, you cannot put a value on it. You cannot put a price on it. You cannot tell, you cannot supplement or or replace the word of God with, with, with money. Wow. I wonder what gonna happen when the times come in the future when paper money will be off the scene. What, what you gonna do? How are you gonna show that? But anyway, I hope you got this tonight. Faith is the word of God. Okay? And God is looking for you to exercise your faith, which is this word, which becomes the terms of agreement. God will work for you when you work the word. God is not going to work for you because you could scream and and do the church Baptist Pentecostal dance. None of that is a requirement to produce. I have given you more than enough evidence. I've given you as much rules and laws of the scriptures that I could. I've given you stories tying all of what I've taught you in those stories to show you this is not my imagination. I'm not making none of this up. This just how it worked for Moses, Joshua, Jehoshaphat, and me. It's worked for me and still working for me. For those of you who haven't experienced this yet, it will work for you also. But you, you, that's why I tell you, and I talk about lazy Christians, if you expect for me to do everything, you expect for me to teach this word, to give you the revelations, to break it down for you, to give it in the detail, to go on Zoom and, and uh, stream yard and, and put it on uh, YouTube and Facebook, to put it on my apps, on my mobile apps, to write it on my blog. You want me to do all the work. And then you still have the audacity to call me and say, Kevin, I need to have a meeting with you because I need you to tell me about these dreams. And they, what is wrong with you? And when I say what is wrong with you, you still believe I am the one that performed the miracle. You still believe that I am the one that's going to bring this change. I, I spend the last three days telling you that whatever I do or anybody else do for, 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 for deliverance, it is a partnership between them and the Almighty God, which you don't want because you've been trained that way. You've got to clear it with your pastor because he's your covering. And you have to know everything what you're doing, even though you've been there for 20 years and there's absolutely no evidence other than you say you're a Christian, that you are. You're far worse in the last 20 years than you were before you came there. There's, why? Why is this happening? Because none of you are following the rules of the scriptures. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, your revelation. We thank you for your word. God, there is absolutely no excuse tonight. There is no excuse tonight. If we have truly followed your rules based on these three nights of teachings, there is absolutely no I don't see why we have to put our confidence in men. This is not to say we should dis buys or dismiss the fivefold ministry. No, no, no. We need them because you have ordained and positioned them to 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 excuse me to teach us. That's what your word is. It says to perfect the saints or to equip us for ministry to enable us now so that we can now edify the body of Christ. So they shouldn't be training us to be like them. They shouldn't be training us to obey and to lord over us. What they should be training us is like what I'm doing right now, training them the word of God so that they can now go off and produce more fruit like I do, and probably even more than me. So I pray, Lord, that, that this is the understanding that they leave here with. They leave here with an understanding that will provoke them to make what they understood practical. And in their confidence in that, just like you said, because of that, they will not produce more fruit. Whatever they ask, you shall give unto them. You will do exceedingly and abundantly. All of the promises, you've done it in the life of Moses, Abraham, Joshua, myself, Hezekiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Obadiah, all of these people. These people are no different. The only difference between them 
and all of the names I've just called is that the names I've just called decide to put their confidence in you and they in turn have been putting their confidence in their models who've been directing them from your terms of agreement, which are the Holy Scriptures. So it is my prayer tonight, Lord, that they come to the understanding of your word. They have a insatiable desire for your word, that, that the word tonight, like I always pray before coming onto these shows or these teachings, that you will ignite such an interest in them for your word after them hearing it, that they will, they, by, by nature now, they want to go and research these scriptures. Are these stories really there? Did, really, did these nations turn on themselves when they were coming to fight the people of God? But because the people of God partnered with God, God sent an ambushment. Who was this ambushment? Were they angels? Who were they? Obviously, they were invisible beings, and they convinced them in such a way that even though they agreed to come and kill Joseph and his crew, they turned on each other. Wow, that's awesome. I, I, I want I want to partner with somebody like that. You know, they're stuck, they're invisible. We, we don't see where any of coming. So I pray, Father God, that your word become alive to them. I pray all the time, uh, Isaiah 11 and 2, that you download to them, like you've done for me, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, certainly the spirit of understanding, the spirit of boldness and counsel and might. I pray that you give them a confidence not to disrespect their leaders, not to, to throw shade at their leaders, but to to be concrete in their understanding that their leaders are not above you. And they are not subject to false doctrine and to submit or even sit under someone who is teaching against your laws. Why? Because you said that anyone who dismisses your law, even their prayer should be an abomination to you. This is your word. This is your word. So, Father, these people now are going to have to make a decision. They are at a crossroad now. They're either going to follow your law after hearing your simple word broken down to them that whereby a child can understand it. They could go with this understanding that is totally scriptural and they were given all of the scriptural basis for it. Or they could be so indoctrinated to their spiritual leaders that they say, you know what? I'm not listening to this no name boy and I'm going to follow my spiritual leader. At that point, Father God, like Moses told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, this day, heaven and earth stand against you. I've given you life and death, blessings and curses. I'm telling you to choose life, but you don't have to do it. But know this though, whatever choice you make, it is determining your end from the beginning. Just like Deuteronomy said, if you hearken and listen unto the voice of the Lord thy God, I will set you on high. The first sign I can promote you. And blessed shall you be in the field, in your body. Blessed shall you be in your storehouses. Verse 12, I will open up the treasures of heaven and pour you out this blessing. Your enemies will come in one way and scatter seven different ways. That's if you made the choice to partner with me by obeying me. Verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28 says, But if you do not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and choose not to obey his commandments, that means you dismiss the law, so now there are penalties that's going to be automatically levied over you. He said, you'll be cursing your body, cursing the field. Your enemies will come in one way. You will have to scatter seven. So the opposite of what obeying the word would have done for you in terms of its promises, you will see the opposite when you reject the word of God. So again, unlike man, God does not force his will on you. He does not force his law. He lays it out there and calls you now to make a conscious decision as the way forward. But know this though. The decisions that we make now is simultaneously determining our end from this beginning and when we make the decision to either follow God or to resist God. So Father God, I cover everyone under the sound of my voice. I pray that even those in the future, even when I'm off the scene, when I'm home to glory with you, that they could look back at these tapes and videos and recordings and be uh, invigorated with your power through these powerful teachings, these detailed teachings, it'll be a blessing to them to make them now look to the word of God, look to the hope of God, which is the word of God. Look to Jesus Christ, which the Bible says that Jesus is the word that became flesh and dwell among us. So Father, we bless you, we honor you, we praise you, and we ask these things in the matchless and the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I want to thank everybody that donated to the Super Chat, even those of you that would have donated to uh, the PayPal and so on. 
People ask me all the time, I want to donate to your ministry. And I say all the time, I don't put it up on Facebook and so on, but under every video on YouTube, I have every piece of information, whether you're donating to Zelle, PayPal, Google Pay. If you want to uh, inquire about a uh, invitation to your church, all of my contact information, everything. If you want to write me, I have all of my contact information. I told you, if you want your mail to get to me quickly, send it to the U.S. Texas address. It'll still come to the Bahamas if you send it to my Bahamas mail, but it just takes a little bit longer, all right? I'm also reiterating to you, for those of you that write me mails through the post office, please, please, when you write, please include your phone number because there are times when I just want to pick up the phone and call. I will pay for the call. It doesn't matter. But just put a phone number there. At, at minimum, uh, put your email, but I prefer the phone number. Even those of you that write me emails, please. I've been telling you, please, if you're going to send me a long thesis, <laughs> Please put it in a voice note form because I'm really turned off. And I, so in fact, someone just sent me something yesterday. They said to me, I'm going to make this short. This is how they started out. I'm going to make this short. Well, what they called short was put 699 paragraphs later. I don't have the time to read that. If you put it in a voice form or, or which I would prefer, put your phone number there. You could state your case, but put everything that you ever emailed me. Or mail me, please. I'm begging you. I'm saying this again. Put your phone number or an e with the written ones that you sent to the post. Put the email, preferably a phone number. If you're gonna send me an email, please put a phone number at the bottom of it. Please. There are times when I'm late up late at night. Sometimes when I'm studying and I cannot go to sleep, I will go browse through some emails. And if I read something that needs important, that was important for me, and if there's a phone number to them, I go and check wherever they're calling from to see their time of the day, and I make arrangements to call them. They don't know I'm calling them. So sometimes you'll get a surprise call from me if that number is there. Okay? So if you send me see a long email, like four to five miles long, and there's no phone number there, I ain't going to read all of that. I can tell you that. I prefer to call you and hear you out so I can minister to you that way. But please, I'm begging you, put, if you're going to write me, put your phone number in your email, put your phone number in your postal mail. Many people on here could tell you they got surprise calls from me and they were shocked sometimes. Sometimes they didn't even believe me until I started making some of my little silly jokes or some of the things that I say on my programs. And they say, oh my God, I can't believe I'm talking to you. Put your phone number if you want that experience in terms of me calling you. Do not worry about, I, I will call you, so this isn't going to cost you. But put it there, and if you're going to write me a long thesis, put it in a voicemail. Many of you have written me some stuff, and I responded in a voicemail, because that's more convenient for me. Remember, put yourself in my position. All day, I'm bombarded, not just you internationally, locally. I told you before, I have WhatsApp, WhatsApps in this phone right here. What's up in this phone all the way back to 2019 that I've yet to open? That's how much I have in here. So people could be sending me stuff. I don't even see those things because I got this. I got counseling sessions. I get getting my notes, doing different teachings, putting things in order. People want me to come by them, pray. All of this stuff I try to jumble up. But then you have these selfish people. Oh, I've been written you. I wrote you four, wrote to you five million times. Well, well then make it five million and one because I'm telling you what to do and you're not doing it. <laughs> okay. And not only that, you don't need me. I keep telling you that. If you follow the teachings, if you follow the teachings, if you follow the teachings, you put your confidence in God. Say, God, I thank you for Kevin. I thank you that he dropped the nugget now that I could use this. But Kevin is not my God. Kevin is not my Savior. Kevin is not my Deliverer. Whatever Kevin is doing, he only could do it because he partnered with God and he subject and submit himself to the terms of, a, of agreement such as the scripture. Hey, you know what? Let me try that. Let me try that. Well, you do that. And if you do that, when you do write me, you'll be writing me a testimony. That's what, as opposed to write me a thesis, something I probably will never read because you didn't follow the rules. I said, put it in a voice note. You didn't listen to me. So when I look at that, I say, look, my eyes hurt from just reading this. Put it in a voice note. Attach a number. Whether you put it in a voice note or not, make sure a number, a phone number, area code is there. More than likely, I pick up the phone and give you a call. Very simple instructions. Okay, that's all I'm asking you to do. So may the peace of God be with you. 
For those of you, tell a friend. Tomorrow I'll be on my radio program, uh, the Kevin L. Ewing Spiritual Insights Show. And my topic tomorrow is witchcraft and relationships. Oh, man, you're going to want to listen to this tomorrow. You're going to know whether your husband or your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your mommy, your daddy, uncle, brother, sister, whether they're under witchcraft controlling powers. They're not the person they used to be. And of course, as usual, I'm going to just laden you with scriptures so that you're going to see the scriptures, not my opinion, not how I feel. I always give my testimony. I was one of them. I was a victim. I was under by two separate ladies under witchcraft spells, under witchcraft attacks. And I'm going to give you all of the signs, what to do, what to look out for. And more importantly, this is the whole purpose of me doing the teaching aside from, I've had several of those cases this week. But I also had planned from last week to do it. And I know the several cases I got this week was only confirmation that I should do it tomorrow. The reason why I really, because the, the teaching is going to be geared more towards now that you see the signs and what this really is from a spiritual perspective, you don't attack the poison. You don't fuss and rave with this poison who was seen now bipolar and moody. No, because when you do that, when you attack or try to contend with them on that level, you're fueling the very spirits that came to torment you and bring a division between you and them. So tomorrow, witchcraft and relationship is what I'm going to be teaching on tomorrow for, for two hours. And bring your pen, bring your notepad, because I am going to li listen. We're going to have scripture after scripture showing uh, evidence of these things in the Bible. And now you're going to see why. When the day you decided to, to, to date this man and cheat on your husband, and you had no idea that this man came from a background of sorcery or he himself was a warlock or which you didn't know that. And when you became one with that person through sexual intercourse, even though you're married, you're not only covenant with them, but the curses now come on you. And now you can't stop dreaming with this man. You know what you're doing is wrong and you don't want to do it. This man is coming in your dreams and having sex with you. No matter when he call you, you don't. You will take the biggest risk ever to be with him. Even though your husband co-workers are going to the very place where this man is telling you to meet. You know you could be caught, but it's like you have no control. Witchcraft on that relationship. Witchcraft over you. Controlling your spirit to do stupid stuff that you would never do under normal circumstances. Well, your brother Kevin L.A. is going to bring you the word of God as it relates to these things tomorrow. Okay? So until then, God bless you. And God keep you. Amen.